Welcome to Pratidwani, where we try to humanize science. I'm your host, G.V. Pawan Kumar. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the guest on this particular episode, Saurabh Dubey. Saurabh is an experimental particle physicist with deep interest in computation and data analysis of the stuff what you get out of a very interesting experimental setup like Large Hadron Collider in CERN and various interesting uh, analysis related to the data what you can extract. He's an associate professor at the Department of Physics at uh, Indian Institute of Science Education and Research, Pune. In this episode, we discussed uh, about his biography, him growing up uh, in Pune and uh, some uh, bits of time he spent at uh, UAE and his experience uh, in uh, studying at Ferguson College, the famous Ferguson College at uh, Pune, his experiences of uh, growing up as a student in this particular city, his initial interest in astrophysics and how it motivated him to further take up uh, particle physics as an important uh, and interesting career, and also his transition uh, from uh, uh, India to USA, first as a PhD student at Rutgers, and uh, later on uh, as a postdoc uh, in uh, Berkeley, California, where he discusses about the work culture and various interesting aspects of uh, his research. We also discussed about uh, research in his own group, especially related to the search of uh, particles beyond standard model, his uh, association with the uh, high energy physics community, specifically the sociology of uh, doing science in large groups which is uh, an inherent characteristics of, uh, of uh, high energy physics experiment list, which is worth uh, noticing. We also discuss about his thoughts on contemporary research, specifically his foray into machine learning and computational physics and how he is blending these uh, emerging research trends with uh, high energy physics, especially experimental particle physics. And it's very fascinating to uh, hear about that. We further go beyond the research and uh, discussed about uh, his outreach activities where he does very interesting programs related to science outreach, uh, both in English and in Marathi and his uh, involvement in uh, uh, initiatives such as IRISE and MSD and also his uh, broader perspective on, uh, on doing scientific research uh, where one can also include uh, various different viewpoints. Uh, from a diversity perspective, including gender equality and also looking at the situation and support system for research scholars and how to improve them, how to interact with them, etc., etc. There's also a very nice segment in Marathi where he explains his motivations and interest. Uh, it's very interesting to hear Saurabh speak Marathi and uh, you will uh, gain some very interesting insights. We also discussed about his other interests. Uh, one of them being uh, reading, where he is a big uh, kind of a, you know uh, reader of Asimov's work, and uh, he also recommends some uh, very interesting uh, books. In, uh, and also, he is a very nice sketcher. Huh? He does a lot of interesting uh, stuff. Also, photography and uh, various different uh, kind of uh, initiatives he has taken in the past few years. Finally, we end uh, uh, with a discussion on uh, future directions in uh, what way he would be able. Uh, be evolving his own research and uh, outreach activities, which is interesting uh, to hear. Saurabh has been my colleague uh, at the physics department at ICF Pune for uh, almost now 10 years. And I always felt that he is one of the most articulate and engaging colleagues to discuss not only just science, but also things beyond science. Uh, Saurabh is not only just a scientist, he is a humanist, which means that uh, he deeply uh, cares about the people uh, uh, around him. And uh, you can see the kind of uh, goodwill he has gained uh, among students and colleagues uh, over the over the decade. I hope you will enjoy this particular conversation where we try to humanize science with Saurabh Dubey. Hi Saurabh, welcome to Pratidwani uh, where we try to humanize science. I am so happy that you are now here to, uh, to, to be you. my Thank guest you, and uh, welcome to Pratidwani. So this is, uh, you know, I've been hearing a bunch of these podcasts already and this is this is really fun. I'm really looking forward to uh, interacting with you here. Super. I think this is a great idea. Super. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sarab, tell us about uh, your biography uh, growing up 
I assume in Pune uh, and uh, tell us uh, uh, all about how you became uh, the scientist, uh, the experimental particle physicist. So, uh, this is interesting, right? Because uh, when we talked about that I should do this thing, I also sort of look back a bit. It is true, I completely identify as a native Punekar mm. um, and uh, this is my thing. But uh, it turns out that uh, it turns out that there are roughly uh, like four parts that I can sort of split my life into because I actually grew up in the Middle East. My dad was a civil engineer. Oh, is it? Okay. So he used to uh, work in Sharjah, Abu Dhabi, and so on. Mm, mm. And uh, you'd be surprised to know. So he he was one of the I mean, so his company and he was also one of the people who helped build the Sharjah Cricket Stadium. <laughs> Amazing! I didn't so, know this. Uh, he has all these pictures with these cricketers, and you know, the, you know, remember the time when yes. they were there to six and yes, whatnot. Yes, yes. So we were actually in Sharjah at that time. So roughly about eight, ten years, I was there. Mm. The next ten, twelve years, I was in India. The next ten, twelve, I was in the US. And now these last ten years, I've been here at ISER. So uh, it's interesting that I still do identify myself as a Punekar. Mm. Uh, you know how you get attached to cities. Yes, so yes, usually yeah, that's yeah. how it goes. So, but you were born. Uh, I was born in Pune, Pune. Um, and then when I was about one, we we, we moved there. Mm. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of things that now I think I were shaped because of I grew up there. So, for example, for for the longest time in school, I had to learn Arabic. Mm. I don't actually remember any of it, um, but it was there. Um, also, the social study. So, it was actually an Indian school. Okay, so it's a CBSE right. Indian school. It was called Sharjah Indian School or Abu Dhabi Indian School. One of these places. Uh, the social studies, along with other things that I don't recall, did actually have the life story of Prophet Muhammad, oh, for example. Wow. So, all of his, you know, how he grew mm. up and his flight to Medina, mm. you know, all of that stuff, we had, we had it. Mm. Um, which is interesting because then when I moved to India, I actually sort of, you know, in Maharashtra, Shivaji is a big thing. So, uh, you know, yeah. every two or three years, there is mm. that, that history mm. comes out. I learned that a bit later than a lot of my peers. Um, so that was an interesting thing. Very interesting. Very interesting. So you are now kind of uh, uh, already in Sharjah as early as let's say in your uh, second or third year of your birth or what? Is yeah. It? So so I moved the we moved there when I was a year old. Oh okay okay. And so from then till I was in fourth standard, I was I was there. Um, so most of it in Sharjah. My brother was born there. Ah, okay. And then like two two and a half years in Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Very yeah. interesting. Very interesting. So now and then later on, you you uh, kind of uh, moved back to Pune, or did you go? Anywhere? No. So so then we uh, my dad a bit later, but me and my mom and my brother we, hmm. we moved back to Pune, and actually we moved back in the middle of uh, the academic year. Wow. And, okay. uh, so I have these. Uh, I mean, traumatic okay. is a big word, but they are sort of memories of. My dad was here and mm. we were going around Pune trying to uh, look for schools mm. and uh, it is interesting now that you know we work here so uh, just for context Loyola school is down the road Yes, yes. and uh, I vividly remember interviewing at Loyola like this is a fourth standard kid right? yeah. they interviewed you and then they actually fair enough they said that we can't admit you now because this is like November you know half yeah, the year is done and so on Okay. and so it took almost a month to find the right school and uh, I remember at the end of that month getting a bit stressed about it. Mm, mm. Initially, when we moved back, it was quite happy, right? You don't have school. It's okay. Something will work out sort of a thing. But a month into the process, I was starting to get a bit worried about, you know, feel that, you know, you're not part of school. People are saying yeah, no to you. Yeah, and you yeah. get a bit worried. Um, actually, that sort of ended up being a very, very crucial and important thing. because So, I ended up in this school called Bhai Shikshan Mandir. Mm, mm. Now it's a reasonably fancy place. They have a management school there and whatnot. It is associated with the uh, uh, Maharashtra Education Society. So the mm, same yes. as Abba Sahib Garwal yes. College. It's yeah. the same society. They used to have a Marathi medium branch in Deccan. And then the English medium had just started up. Mm -hmm. Now the school building was really old. Um, uh, sorry, it was, was really new. They were still constructing it. Uh, the ground floor was not finished. The staircase uh, was not painted and so on when I started there. While it seemed that it, this, you know, it's like a step down in life yes, from, from yes. a better school, <laughs> it turned out that the school was very small. So there was only mm. one division per mm. class. class. Okay. And the division was maybe 50 odd students. Mm. And I mean, all teachers are really exceptional. But, mm. you know, I, I like to think that the you know, two or three teachers I had, they're really, really influential and exceptional. Um, and that sort of helped a lot. Um, 
there are a lot of silly things like so when i moved here for example for some reason when i was in abu dhabi mm. uh, my school bag was actually a briefcase wow. you know one of these square things <laughs> with the latches that open okay okay and i used to carry that there no issues uh-huh. when i came here for the first month that is what i brought in and i got made fun of a little bit for for doing it it's very unusual <laughs> yeah, absolutely uh, and so then i remember going to bombay dying and buying one of these regular <laughs> sacks and so on uh so the transitions are a bit difficult it's it's kind of amazing so you know that world of being a child uh and also getting exposed to totally different cultures right is a very unique experience right. did you feel that in fact i was yeah that is really true um because of that transition at some point since it happened early enough one gets used to the idea of being an outsider mm. and uh i mean skipping ahead a bit but that made a huge decision after 12th when i was going to get admitted to a bsc program mm, mm. you know like now even back then everybody wants you to do btech or yeah, b yeah. and so on uh, my parents are fairly supportive but there is uh, implicit support which is like fine we trust you do what mm. you want but the rest of society you know has this thing that how can you do a bsc how can you not even attempt to do a b Absolutely. You know, if you don't get admitted, fine. Fine. Yeah. Of, yeah. Know, say okay, I'll do a BSc. Yeah. Uh, I think what helped was if you go through this phase of being used to the idea of being an outsider, or at least you know it, it's not as traumatic anymore. Yeah. You're like fine. Things will work out. It's not the end of the world. Mm-hmm. You'll mm-hmm. make friends. You'll do stuff. Um, I, I think that that helps. Very um, interesting. Very interesting. So then, uh, at this particular point of time, paint us a picture about Pune you are living in. Uh, right. because you know that is a con- uh, kind of a place we all have kind of you know f- fallen in love with <laughs> because yeah, as a person yeah, who has come from outside now yeah, for now, a, long yeah time, a long time 10, 12, and uh, uh, it has its own charm but uh, give a kind of paint as a picture of uh, of uh, how it was then so it's rather interesting because so this week has been unusually cool yeah. uh, this morning we read we are cooler than jammu yes. today yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I remember winters being reasonably cold. Mm. Uh, later during my college or even MSc, I used to come to University of Pune and I used to use this Pashan Road. Mm. Mm. Um, and of course, back then it was much less crowded, much narrower, lot more trees. Uh, so it did feel like you know you're going outside mm. somewhere. You know, like now you would feel about Ronawala, you would feel that. Uh, broadly, infrastructure was a lot less. So. Mm. Uh, Aund and Baner, where I said is right now, mm, this mm. would be thought of as you know a, a completely different part. Uh, uh, I mean, not in the city at all. Okay. Uh, when when we moved back to India, we uh, my dad bought a place in Dhanukar Colony. So this mm. is go through. It's about ten kilometers from Mysore. Mm. Um, it's also only maybe five kilometers away from Deccan, which you could say mm. is the heart yeah. of the city. Yeah. My grandmother was quite traumatized. She <laughs> she complained bitterly to my dad. You know, you're gonna go live so far. We'll never see you. Why are you doing this? And it's it's silly. Like you know, now uh, I used to get into these interesting fights. So I I after my twelfth, I went to Ferguson College. Uh, Actually, after tenth, yeah. junior college there. I had a friend in junior college who used to uh, live in Aund. There's mm. a really Roop Mati or something. It's an mm. old society mm. in Aund, mm. Aund Gao. His house from Ferguson is the same distance as my house was, but because of these perceptions, it was always okay for people to go towards Kothrud, okay, not okay. towards Aun. Aun. And he would get quite angry about it that you know I come the same distance, why can't you ever come visit me? <laughs> yeah. why, why should I come there? <laughs> Very interesting. Um, Pune has always been this sort of a small city vibe, mm, right? Like yes. you go around by rickshaw. Yeah. So a- anything that is ten kilometers is insanely far away. Yeah. Um, my early experiences of when we went to Mumbai, and you know you. Look up like regular maps at mm. that point to find out like Andheri is like thirty kilometers away from something. It's mind blowing to have a city that you know you can't tell where the city stops. It's exactly what's going on and on. For a Pune person, that's very unusual. Unusual, you know, it's absolutely. A, it's a very absolutely. small city vibe. Yeah, that is actually one of the uniqueness about the city because uh, it's neither too big that you get lost completely, nor is it a very small place where you can tell okay, oh, it's just a next door or exactly. something. Exactly, like, like there are new parts to explore. Explore, yeah. but most of them are not really that far. Yes, think, absolutely. In fact, that's been our experience too. And uh, also, uh, it there is also a uniqueness for different parts, right? That is another very interesting. Yeah, they're they're very distinctive. Distinct, yeah. This also meant, but that it was quite okay uh, to go around on a bicycle. Mm. So. Uh, now i'm also a bit more say protective of my son but mm. certainly for me um, through school 
in fifth or sixth i think i started to go around by bicycle mm. and then it was quite okay to you know for for my mom to let me go wherever, wherever i thought nice um, nice so the only limiting being how long i wanted to go yeah, on bicycle yeah. as a person that's the only case. kind of limitation so this is also roughly around uh, uh, maybe 80s uh, late 80s we are uh, talking about yeah late 80s mid 90s mid 90s okay yeah. okay mid 90s yeah that's it so which means that uh, it is also a time when uh, the economics is kind of gradually changing in the country because uh, one could really see that there was a lot of difference uh, also me growing up as a 80s kid and transitioning transitioning into 90s that cusp generally is felt yes, uh, yes. Uh, although it, one can actually reflect upon that in, in a later stage for example very simple things like uh, even bicycles yeah. right you would actually see only certain branch right, uh, right. as uh, things the change yeah like, exactly yeah, then the bsa slr yes, came yes, and then exactly. hero okay <laughs> another kind of thing because that is the first kind of exposure for right. for a kind of an economic change uh because then even then the two wheelers had not really emerged although right. pune really is one of the main places of that kind so how was your experience did you feel that kind of change of so, course you had already seen it abroad exactly so, yeah. so moving back that actually was a was a big change um for me so i actually love television mm, mm. um we'll maybe come back to it later but i love sitcoms mm, mm. but the transition there was so i remember uh, my school used to be a day school so 8 to 3 or something and i would i would rush home um at 4 o'clock uh, there would be cartoons on tv of mm. course they would be started by the 4 o'clock prayer mm, so mm. so you know <laughs> okay. you had the, the uh, mosque prayer uh. and then you would have tom and jerry or something start yeah. up when i moved to uh, india it was at that point primarily doordarshan mm. right and and this cable sort of came around 92 93 maybe a bit later of course uh, it you know parents didn't want to do that because they thought you would spend all your day yeah. doing that yeah um, it was around the 96 world cup or a little mm-hmm. earlier mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. i could finally convince them enough that okay look all the matches are there you, you know you have to buy this exactly so, <laughs> you know since we are actually talking on 28th of october <laughs> as the world cup is going on exactly. even now it's very interesting connection because most of our lives actually can be matched with the world cup you, schedules exactly, right, right, right. <laughs> you, you remember each one what you were doing at that time, that time so, absolutely yeah. right very very fascinating very fascinating so uh, so the foundation of uh, you kind of getting interested in science and like that is something of very high interest uh, to me here uh, how was your kind of uh, background uh, in science growing up uh, both uh, at uh, uh, uae and uh, and and uh, in in pune so uh, i don't remember especially science being pushed as a subject in uae mm. mm. uh, i mean i was interested but more or less at that point um, english was a big thing for me i i like to read mm. so even then i used to try to read a lot of books um, I actually like maps quite a bit. Mm, so mm. I love atlases. I can you know stare at an atlas for an yeah. hour and that's that's very enjoyable. Uh, so I, till I moved to India even a bit later um till 6th or 7th I I hadn't really thought of science as necessarily a career. One of the things that uh, you would also perhaps remember this but maybe it was Maharashtra board. Mm. In the algebra and geometry of say 7th 8th or 9th standard at the end of the book there used to be problems that mm, you're supposed yeah, to solve. Yeah, yeah. and uh, they used to come in four groups group a group b group c group d mm-hmm, mm-hmm. now they were meant to go up in scale of difficulty with a being really easy uh, and d being so difficult that they will never come on an exam mm-hmm. and uh, so i uh, i remember me and my bench partner and and the two people in front of us mm-hmm. um, one of whom i ended up marrying <laughs> we'll come to that <laughs> yeah. so uh, we would solve uh, these c c group and d group problems and and for the first time that was uh that was very rewarding mm. the idea that here is something challenging mm. um as as measured by somebody else right because they are telling you it's group d yes uh, so you think it's challenging mm. and then if you can solve a couple of those you get this uh, you know hit of endorphin like oh you know i was good at this and there is a bit of a competition there's four people so different people trying to do different things in geometry or algebra so i remember i was slightly better at algebra and mm. my partner was slightly better at geometry mm. so mm. that was the first time it showed you know these things that you can imagine doing this for a living, living. Like, you know trying to mm. solve 
intellectual problems. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, now that I'm grown up, of course, all careers have intellectual have challenges. Yes, absolutely. But when you're a kid, I think you know you you don't really appreciate mm. as much as what does a civil engineer do, what does an architect do. So then that sort of pushed me towards the scientific subjects because in school they tend to be more challenging. Um, and and my genre of reading is also science fiction. Mm. Mm. So roughly around the same time that this was happening. Um, I discovered Isaac Asimov. Oh wow! Okay. And, uh, okay. So, so I I read them out of order, but uh, but but that really caught my fancy. He, to date, he remains my favorite author. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, mm. In fact, nowadays to fall asleep, I have been listening to you know audio books. Yeah. I know the story. I listen to an Asimov story because then I know the story. I fall asleep. <laughs> wonderful. It's wonderful. Nice. 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 So these two things together sort of. Push me a bit towards physics more than the other sciences. Nice, you know, like nice. the idea of being in a spaceship, yeah, traveling yeah. somewhere, you know, and then from there you transition to learning about the planets and what are stars, of course, what are black holes. You know, nice. you, you do the whole usual usual thing. thing. Yeah. Uh, I I and, but I did read fairly widely. So mm. aside from Asimov, uh, I remember in the tenth standard vacation. So on Deccan there is this lane called Hong Kong Lane. I think it's still there, mm-hmm, mm. and it used to have a bookshop. Hmm. Uh, of old used books, new books, all of it. But it's a small sort of cubby bookshop. Uh, clearly, he didn't make enough money from selling the books. So hmm. what he would allow is you could also do a library there, oh. and he would make a lot of money there. Oh. The nice thing was he didn't actually care that it was a library. So you paid some monthly amount. He didn't care if you changed the book once a day, twice a day, whatever. As oh. long as you want, you bring the old book back, take the new one. Back. Nice. And he would let you do that. Nice. And in that summer, I I read a lot of books, uh, mostly science fiction. But hmm. I don't know if you know. So Robin Cook, yes, yes, writes about these medical yes, medical things. things yes. John yes. Grisham's Law. And, yeah, yeah. But the nice thing is, if you read uh, a lot of them in a small period, like, you start to see these patterns. Like I read the fifth Robin Cook, and then I was like, okay, I know what he's doing. You know, you sort of sense the pattern. Yes, and, yes. You know, John Wonderful. Grisham with the law and so on. <laughs> law. Yeah. And that's when it sort of really drove home the fact that of all of those things, I I enjoyed the science descriptions a bit more, more. and so on. Nice. One of my favorite books to date is the, the book Jurassic Park. Mm, mm, so, mm. what I like about it is that so Michael Crichton, all of his yeah, you know, books yeah, are yeah, in movies yeah, and whatnot. Yeah. He blends science where there are facts along with like fiction, fiction. and and you can't tell and. Uh, now maybe you know having worked in science we have better markers for you know you can tell maybe this isn't really true, true or this is stretching yeah. the truth but at that point all of it seemed true and and it's quite fascinating so he talks in jurassic park about uh, fractals yes and yes. he talks about you know not nonlinear dynamics specifically mm. but you know ian malcolm who's the mathematician in the book uh, he's given all the good lines. Mm, you know, mm. Life finds a way, and yeah, you know yeah, those yeah, sort of things. Yeah. He's he's very eccentric. Yeah. He always dresses in black, uh, uh. and so I did identify with the character. I identified with the. So he describes this center for chaos uh. in uh, Santa Fe. Uh huh. Yes, yes. And and so I I read Jurassic Park, uh. and it turned out that not too long after, like six months later, there is a book Chaos by James Gleick. James Gleick. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I read them together. That also talks about you know Santa Fe Center and whatnot. Yes, and, and absolutely, absolutely. I think that sold me on the idea that you know science is a career as well. It, it, it's you know you you like it, but clearly there are people who are working as scientists. Scientists, and uh, it's quite glamorous in some sense. Very fascinating. Very fascinating. Because see, this uh, element of fiction is very important, right? Because all of us have grown up listening to stories, and. Uh, one might like it or not they always have a very strong imprint on on the way you think and and especially i think back then that was a much bigger way for us to experience the world right mm. i mean th- there's no smartphones there's no youtube absolutely right, right. so absolutely. that book becomes your connect to stuff that is beyond your immediate purview I mean, this is a point i would want to expand a little bit more you know in the in the era where there are so many other avenues for yeah. your dopamine yeah, <laughs> to, fix, get, yeah. to, to get really Kind of uh, high, uh, the joy you extract out of uh, reading mm-hmm. a book uh, actually has a slightly more cognitive component to that, right? See, I'm not no way telling that uh, uh, you know uh, listening to <laughs> podcast <Right>. or uh, <laughs> or let's say watching a, a video is uh, is something which is not bad or something like that. But the amount of 
kind of you know uh, the intellectual processing you have to do in in reading is much more no i agree right uh. i mean even with the podcast it engages only one sense at a time yes which means you fill in the rest of the details yourself right? yeah, you absolutely. read you need to imagine the world absolutely when you're hearing you know you imagine the faces and the setting i think that is right it's cognitively much more richer than all your senses being senses. engaged at the same time but do you think we are doing enough uh, see i'm not talking mm. about just only uh, uh, children or students but as as a kind of a society not only again indian society do you think we are doing enough because that is one kind of concern i have uh, because see for example if somebody wants to create an audio or even some podcast uh, the p- people who are involved in it of course can really think through and do something hmm. but as a consumer sometimes hmm. i have a slight uh, kind of uh, uh, concern that it becomes little passive right right whereas in reading right even if you call something as a passive reading correct the, as you mentioned you have to really imagine and process things right. do you do you think that there is more I room for that it's interesting because uh, for the longest time if somebody asked me what my hobby was i would say it was reading hmm. I, i remember hmm. many a times uh, ignoring friends calls to come play because i'm in the middle of a book okay, okay. and shit but lately i find i don't read as much as mm, i would mm, then mm. and it is a it is a bit concerning like in the sense that i don't think any of us nowadays read as much as we could yes. should yes. and thus that leads us to not spend as much time you know yeah absolutely sharpening these sharpening, other things sharpening yeah. the other things another experience i have had is also the process of writing sometimes actually is even more enriching sometimes i'm not anyway comparing any other things but somehow if you are uh, writing and if you are reading to write mm. it actually gives you a very different dimension so is uh, reading to teach correct. correct that is something all of us agree right most exactly. of the time our colleagues all of us discuss about this that teaching actually really brings in <laughs> a lot so of when it. i heard like santanam uh, uh, podcast uh, uh, i know he also writes he also writes yes, a bit yes. that's true right that is it's a step higher than reading because now you need to create that world well, and, yes. and you need to worry about how somebody is going to read it i think uh, so now in schools for example they have these creative writing things mm. as mm. part of the syllabus i think that's wonderful wonderful yes i mean rather than consume you you create and, create. and that's always a, a, a lot better absolutely in fact we'll come to that point especially mm. when we discuss a little bit more about education because of, of, in addition to being teachers researchers we are also fathers yes, <laughs> and that's that right. is an important dimension uh, right. which we should not ignore yeah, uh, yeah. there is a very critical aspect of it uh, but uh, in this particular situation then uh, going back to your biographical kind of sketch is that you are now getting exposed to this great fiction and you are also simultaneously doing normal studies uh, how was your kind of performance in school and and uh, especially i'm interested in high school right. because we slowly will transition right. into right. higher higher so uh, w- one incident that was actually a bit um, so all right so in 6th and 7th uh, grade i didn't really score mm. that well mm. um, and in hindsight i don't know why uh, mm. it wasn't that the material was difficult mm. there is some sort of intellectual i think laziness that creeps in yeah. you, know, you, you don't pay attention mm. but uh, i think it was the summer after 9th standard mm. so on law college road there is this uh, aryabhat academy ah, ah yes yes there is the, i i've heard about it that's place yeah, yeah, yeah. um baskaracharya baskaracharya pratishtha that's right that's uh, yeah. what it is and they ran a um, like a summer workshop that mm. that now is quite in vogue but that time was rare and uh, me me and a friend of mine we sort of bicycle there to do this nice in the first day second lecture for second lecture we were so much at sea and see this is after the point that like i was saying we used to solve these group a b c d mm. and you know mm. we thought we were good at maths we were really at sea and uh, after the third day we didn't even go for the remaining two days because we said we are not getting anything out of this no. we just get out of home roam around no. and go back uh, which in that instant was fine right you know we we made peace with the fact that look we are not getting anything out of this no sense in sitting and spending the whole mm. day there mm. but it did play a role in sort of me feeling that that's not good like you know uh, it's of course ego in some sense for mm. you to feel that you should understand everything but that did exist at that point and nice. and it was quite a you know it was a good awakening to have mm. that mm. look there's much more that you should do you could do so you can't be satisfied i think that helped quite a bit mm. um, so so then going on to high school 11th and 12th um, i was in ferguson college mm. for yes. 11th yes. junior college yeah. as well 
and like any big college uh, the, the transition is really quick where now they rely on the responsibility being yours yours absolutely like the student the, student becomes the correct. central point yeah. the, the, the faculty member is going to come and do something but yeah. it's not like school they don't care yeah. you know how you learn and what not that helped quite a bit because then um, the freedom that i got there i yes. managed to sink into learning by myself um, you know read a book and, and learn yeah. um, so that was a that was a good thing to do which also meant that um, it's strange for us as both being you know faculty members mm -hmm. here but complaints of students about uh, faculty not teaching them mm -hmm. or not being good I, i'm not as sympathetic because i think that's a perennial problem yes yes rarely do you run into a faculty member who's actually so good that you know they change how you think most of the time faculty members do their end of the thing and you are supposed absolutely. to do your end of the thing absolutely absolutely um, yeah. and that's a really good skill to i think uh, develop like you know you, you learn by yourself learn by yourself and also see the, the e, e, this becomes even more important given the fact that now uh, the component of teaching and also the viewpoint of teaching uh, has evolved right, right? because right. E, earlier when we were also students information was on a premium that's right right that's uh, right because uh, they didn't uh, have textbooks yeah, you know, there's no e copy yeah, there, there, there's no e copy or internet was not there at yeah. least uh, to a large stage of our uh, kind of uh, growing up years which means the teachers uh, become also source of your information that's right and many a times the access to books uh, had to be only through uh, library and right. other places and you can't take it home you can't there, take it home you sit there yeah. this yeah. will constrain how you are right. uh, taking in but now i think that constraints are all lifted correct uh, and uh, that brings its own kind of complications of course which then maybe makes it fair that students don't expect the faculty member to convey just information mm. that mm. because since they have access to it they expect you to do something else absolutely which is maybe different from from what i felt maybe at that time right you you're right that, that you're, then the professor is the main person who's going to give you information absolutely yeah. absolutely so then uh, you you i spent uh, uh, how many years in ferguson so total it was my two junior college years mm. and then three years of my uh, undergraduate wonderful so, so see ferguson college yeah. historical you know such a rich history Uh, so much so that uh, people like Gokhale, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thought about, and, and they used to let us know this that that uh, I don't remember if Rajiv Gandhi, but certainly P V Narasimha Rao was there for a bit. Oh, um, okay, and, and then you know he was at the same time our prime minister. Prime minister, so, wow, yeah. okay, yeah, because uh, it has a very rich history, and also so many stalwarts have kind of graduated out of that particular college. And uh, I also see that you still have the connection to that I, particular I do, college, which we'll, we'll yeah. also discuss a little bit. Uh, paint as a picture about the college days, uh, because that is actually a very crucial part of most of the scientists. Right. Uh, could you just give us a little bit of? So uh, since I did my junior college there, what was nice was uh, the 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 step into a bigger sort of a institution, right? Mm. In school, also I, like I said, I was in a smaller school. <clears> everybody <throat> knew everybody. But in college, that was different. So I got used to uh, in junior college the idea that the college is much larger than what you know. You maybe know four other people. Mm. Uh, the nice thing about an undergraduate degree at Ferguson was that there was a, a lot of respect for you to be a nerd, mm. you to mm. be you know like really like academics and mm. push into it, and that helps quite a bit. So. Uh, we didn't really have a college fest or stuff mm, like that. Yeah. Uh, may maybe there was one in the three years I was there. The first year of undergraduate, maybe there was a freshers party, mm. but that freshers <laughs> party was somewhere far away and cost a lot, so I didn't go. <laughs> okay, uh, it was not in college. <laughs> but the academic environment was. See, they didn't actually do stuff to for you to you know learn academically, mm, mm. but. It was expected that if you have an idea to pursue something, there is support. Support. Like if yeah. you want to be like the biggest physics nerd that there is, mm. or you want to get into you know how photography, how lenses are made. Nice. You would find somebody there who shared that interest, who was willing to engage with you on that uh -huh. and push you uh, along. That that is very important in in any sort of a undergrad. Undergrad. Right? Right? Like yeah, uh, it's the kind of things we try to nurture here. Absolutely. Now. Absolutely. Uh, I, I was happy to have that. Um. I think Ayuka, mm. uh, being in Pune, yeah. uh, has always plays played an outsized role, at least in the physics. Absolutely, part. absolutely. So, so almost everybody I know at that point who's interested in physics wanted to do astrophysics. Astrophysics. <laughs> so, so in the first year of our undergraduate at Ferguson, we, us and the batch above us, we we started Astro Club. Uh, now it's in its twenty fifth running, and you know it's it's an excellent, fantastic, uh, thing. fantastic. Uh, 
that helped quite a bit so this means that you have now a set of like 15 or 20 kids who are all interested in in science all want to do the same things you want to do so you know we would we had a apollo missions to the moon exhibition wonderful and so then every three group of three people you find out apollo 10 you find out apollo 11 make a poster mm. mm. um, and these posters are like handmade right mm. like you print out the paper <laughs> yes. and you paste yeah. it uh, that environment was was really good um see that probably also is a tribute to professor narlikar i call it yes. as narlikar effect in yes. pune yes. because you know i am amazed in fact that is something which is not emphasized a lot you know it's very easy sometimes to get swayed by other people yes. who we call generally as celebrities no offense to anybody who is doing something else but you know the imprint and the impact what narlikar yeah. has on on ecosystem in maharashtra yeah you know i went to a, 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 a film festival a science film festival and one of the ma- crucial elements was a uh, was a story which uh, professor narlikar had uh, done the sto- he had written he had written and they were actually kind of uh, doing a, a reading of that particular story <laughs> and you know it's it's really really one of the greatest impacts which we sometimes don't give more emphasis I, on now uh, that you say that it is really true because of him mm. you know even outside if you go tell that i'm interested in astronomy and khol yeah. in yeah. khol shastra yeah. everybody knows yes. people in society know and so they look at it with respect there is no surprise at what is this I mean, this is him exactly. him writing in marathi him writing oh, exactly yeah. sir this is one thing i would want to yeah. go a little bit further you know he writes in marathi yeah. uh, uh, and you know of course i'm kind of basically learning bits and pieces because my daughter is also That's learning right. things but you know i went to that particular uh, festival and i could see the imprint it has on yeah. people and if you start at uh, talking about science in their uh, mother tongue especially in their local language right. you know you are not only communicating science you are actually communicating scientific thinking exactly uh, which is actually something which we badly need in india right it, this is what i really like about the series also mm. most of the time we think of outreach as you know school kids we yes. call it yes. that's not no. true it's, it's adult outreach right? exactly. like reaching out to society absolutely. why shouldn't a lawyer be interested in what you do and you have to know absolutely so, no in fact you know this is something i discuss a lot i have discussed with yeah. you also in the past as you correctly mentioned children are already sold on science yeah exactly you know the greatest enthusiasm is always among children uh, for science because they know it's so interesting they are also naturally inclined towards climate uh, you, you kind of ecosystem because right. that's part right. of their education exactly. they've been told about it they're naturally uh, curious, curious so they and other things yeah. Yeah. yeah as you grow up you tend to actually deviate from from uh, yeah. scientific process of uh, looking at things I, i'm not anyway telling that people lose interest right, right. but somehow it gets degraded as as exactly. it uh, other process. things take up things yeah. their prejudices i think set in a bit more yes. because of life experience absolutely yeah. so in that sense uh, your experience in ferguson probably would have exposed you to very interesting kind of the plethora of uh, ideas right so the year i was there in in my first year uh, ferguson along with a couple of other colleges here sp college which mm. is a big one and garwari they also started a diploma in scientific computing nice nice um, so i actually have this piece of paper that says i have this diploma wonderful year and half thing it, it turned out that that was less of uh, i mean computing as the way we see it now uh, but it was more about learning computer languages and stuff so um, i knew a little bit about dos ah, i think ah. you know everybody learns that at a little bit i didn't have a computer at home at that point but they taught us c c++ you know visual basic and and one other thing i forget what it was mm. um, and then you make these small applications you put the buttons and you click and what not now of course we all realize and even i do quite a bit that learning to program is also learning to think algorithmically think right absolutely and that's the real thing like i appreciate that quite a bit that that also happened concurrently at the same time nice um, nice and uh, it was so the classes used to happen from 6 to 7:30 in the evening um, and college used to start at you know 8 or 9 um, and i would at least go up there i wouldn't say i attended all lectures mm-hmm. but i would certainly show up so this ended up you know being a pretty long day for a for a significant amount of time for 6 to 8 months it was a very long day so much so that so i'm a punekar i would yeah. bring tiffin from home or something mm-hmm. but because this was a long day at one point i explored the local mess nice so i would walk with a friend to the bmcc mess because they served better chapatis <laughs> uh, i think that is uh, in hindsight i don't think it was planned out that way but putting in effort is really important like mm-hmm. you know many a times you sort of tend to think that this is very inconvenient 
I'm already tired. I don't want to do this extra bit. But I think you have to push yourself. Push so yourself. You, you do these things. They play off in, in really yeah. good ways later on. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. That is such an important point, right? Because sometimes uh, uh, that even delta of an effort. <laughs> right. It's, exactly. It's small things that add up. Yes. Yes. So then, uh, if I understand correctly, then you are already. Making a decision of going into physics when you are at Ferguson. Yeah. So so um, the, and and it's the same thing, right? So Ferguson at that point or even now I think mm. has a system where in the first year you pick four subjects, uh, mm. in the next one you pick three out of the four, mm. and the last one you pick one. That's mm. your major. Yeah. So uh, I started with physics, math, statistics, and electronics. Nice. M many of my batchmates at that point wanted to do electronics mm. because it's employable in principle. Um, Okay, maybe mm. it is, mm. Mm. Uh, but I knew I wanted to do physics. Mm. The the only real thing that came close to sort of you know seducing me away was statistics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to formally learn it, to see precision, mm. and and mm. it's like a pure science, it, right? I mean, it is of course a pure science. Yeah. It, but it holds a lot of these things that you know how distributions of things behave. Very correct. Yes. That is not something that we necessarily learn in physics per se, right? Because at a higher physics, we do when when we have aggregates okay. of things. Yes. But in the beginning, you learn about one projectile, yes. and you learn about you know f equals m with one car and whatnot. Whereas in statistics, they talk about you know you can't see things mm -hmm. with just three or four, but exactly. properties of bulk. Absolutely right. Um, this is a very is very important observation. Uh, I I assume that would have also uh, influenced you to actually go into machine learning in particle physics, which we're going to Much talk later. <laughs> yeah, later. Yeah. Uh, but what you're mentioning is very important, and I would want to ask your views on this. See, we generally uh, uh, have a very strong kind of component of calculus right. at the junction of uh, transition from school to college. Right. That is one of the major kind of right. transitions right. which happen. I don't see that uh, same emphasis given to, let's say, a statistical way of looking at things. Yeah. In fact, now we are realizing it more and more right. that it is equally important part of uh, uh, math education, in, right? In today's world, especially, right? yes. because most of our things that a common person would come across are statistical in nature. It could be election results, uh, you know, two, two out of three dentists recommend yeah. this to yeah. us. All of that, <laughs> I mean, an understanding of a little bit of probability, a little bit of statistics would go a long, long way. Lo well, yeah. long way. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's a great training yeah. you're, for you're a physicist. Right. It's actually on par with calculus, calculus. is yeah. you know, important in the modern world. Modern. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then uh, you started getting interested in some part of physics then? It was always astrophysics. It's always astrophysics. So <laughs> okay. doing this astro club, uh, first year, second year, and, uh, you know, I think uh, to be honest, so this is an exercise I like to do with our ISS students uh, now. So we get the cat out of the bag. Uh, <laughs> uh, can you name five subfields of physics, mm, right? Mm. I don't think in my second or third year, I, maybe five I could have, but mm. it's a lack of exposure. Yes, um, yes. So you knew astrophysics, you know that you can make a career at this. Mm. Uh, it is true that, you know, a brief history of time is written by <laughs> an astrophysicist. Um, actually, that was the only big thing. Mm. Uh, Michio mm. Kaku and Neil deGrasse yeah. Tyson are, are newer. Uh, but yes, it was always astrophysics and that's what I thought. In fact, that continued uh, I even applied to PhD programs wanting to do astrophysics. Hmm. I ended up at Rutgers and for the first month there, I sort of, you know, tried to shadow a couple of astrophysicists, uh -huh. seeing if they'll take me on as a student. Okay. So that lasted quite a bit. Oh, is it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Um, uh, but so then, then that's an actually interesting thing. So after my BSc in, in Ferguson, I, I, uh, I did in a year of my master's in, in the university, but I got admitted to the PhD program. So after I landed up there, um, I was uh, silly enough, for example, to volunteer to uh, invigilate an exam for an astrophysicist. <laughs> okay. Because I thought that, you know, okay, that's a good chance for him to know me and I can, you know, sneak uh -huh. a chat with him. Of course, it's silly because in invigilation, you're not supposed to talk to each other. You walk <laughs> up and down aisles. So that didn't work. Uh, that was when at a departmental sort of tea or something, my my actual, who became uh -huh. my advisor, Sunil Somadwar. So he found me. Um, you know, he said, come, let's have a chat. Mm. And uh, there is a book by, I think, George Gamow from which this comes. But he did this exercise with me mm. of uh, parity, mm. right? So, the mm. idea is, suppose you make friends with an alien and, uh, you know, you talk to the alien, you, you know, you're communicating in English, but nevertheless, no. uh. Uh, and you haven't met the alien yet. Okay. And uh, you describe each other. So, you know, 
the alien says can you describe how you look uh. you say look you know i'm sort of symmetric around uh, the axis uh, uh, um i have appendages like uh, two two and two four uh, and uh, uh, then you say internally what's going on well okay i have a heart on the left side of my uh, body uh, and the alien asks you what's left uh, what does it mean left, left side uh, uh, now the point being that can you unambiguously using external things describe left from right without mm-hmm. you know yeah. mixing it up yeah. it's a relative thing right exactly yeah, yeah. and and so he he had this discussion with me where he eventually successfully managed to describe uh, parity and parity violation uh, which i really only understood much much later. much later but at that point he did demonstrate that there is an unambiguous way that nature decides what is left and right mm. it, it's not symmetric in the sense that you could just replace left with right there nice. are some things that pick one over the other then he asked me so what do you like i said i like to code i've done this diploma i like quantum mechanics klebsch gordon coefficients uh, uh, so okay, okay. um he says well you know you may not know it yet but actually you will really do well in particle physics so do you want to try working with me for 3 months oh uh, and i said sure let's try and uh, you, you know to find a faculty member is actually interested, interested yeah, that's yeah. already a big deal yeah yeah and since he said 3 months i knew it wasn't a commitment yeah. okay i'll try i i just fell in love with uh, it i mean the nice. first 3 months were were uh, i didn't I, i hadn't actually thought of particle physics before that you do the basics right everybody knows what quarks are and you know yeah. some of the like brief history of time level stuff uh, but he was really good at giving me space to do some things and yet pointing out you need to do this you need to do that 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 really sold me those 3 months is when i completely fell in love with saying i want to do experimental particle physics fantastic for the rest of my life fantastic um, fantastic now uh, when i talk to students but I I like the thing that this happened much much later. Later, in life. exactly, it, precisely right. It can't happen in your first year. I I you know I thank my stars that I was <laughs> willing to go out and out. say okay I like this let me try it out. Nice, not, nice. Not not have this thing that no I said astro so I must do astro. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. In fact, if anything, that is probably the best way to really. proceed all throughout your career uh, in a way to be open ended at keep uh, doors open as long as, as long can, as, as you yeah. can uh, there's there's a gun to your head don't think what exactly yeah. exactly that's absolutely right because see that is a kind of a common theme for so many of us including me I know. Uh, because astro is always uh, the most yeah. uh, attractive the easiest thing to get into, get into. Yeah. and it actually teaches you that uh, there are so many interesting uh, segues you actually can yeah. take and uh, that's a very fascinating thing so this transition from pune to us how was it sort of so um honestly uh, th- there was a lack of exposure <laughs> in the sense that i had not appreciated that while i wanted to be a scientist what mm. exactly the individual mm. step should be mm. um even even the transition to the us was a bit happenstance so mm. i i had my mindset that okay we we need to do a phd mm. um my my mom's brother my mama uh-huh. so he is actually uh, an ncl phd and now i mean for a long time he's been a faculty member at clemson he's the chair oh, of oh, uh, bioengineering there nice nice so he, he started off as a chemist and i mean uh-huh. now he's in the bio, he's a biochemist uh-huh. or bioengineer uh-huh. actually okay okay that helped because at least there was a template of what academic careers are like you know there are things like a postdoc yes. there are faculty <laughs> positions as opposed to scientific positions uh-huh. but the discussion was not uh, as clear right yeah. it's like okay you understand that yes there is a way to earn money at this but we'll figure it out when we get there, get there. you don't need to worry about it now the immediate Absolutely. goal was get into a phd program now, a friend of mine so in pune there is this thing called dilip oaks academy mm, mm. he prepares all these engineering people for their ms applications to the us and so with this friend i joined up mm. i did the class i took the exam and it sort of just you know you know happened like happened. it just sort of drifted along you say fine i'll do this next step and i'll do the next step and i applied um at that point i was actually more interested in other things so uh, rensselaer polytechnic uh-huh, yeah. which is from where are holiday yeah. or ethnic yeah, yeah, yeah rpi right yeah uh, exactly they had a center for uh, origins in life program oh nice and so uh, out of the place that i applied to this was actually one of my top Choices. choices. Like I wanted to go to I me. Mean, it sounded fantastic. Yeah, of course. Like a physicist who gets to work on origins of life. Um, I suspect a bit of it was coming from this chaos and uh, that sort of yes, world. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's what I had really wanted to do. Um, then, of course, I got into Rutgers, so I said, "Fine, we'll 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 end up there." See, funding is also a thing, right? Like you get into programs, you have enough money to support. So, any place that's going to give you full funding is, of course, also going to play a, play a role. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but that was also a thing. Um, wonderful, wonderful. 
so the 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 american kind of uh, way of doing science is something also very enterprising and uh, it is uh, a different culture not only in terms of uh, living but also the way you think what science is right, right? Uh, right. because uh, i actually visited or rather spent time only during my postdoctoral days right. of course i had gone to us for a short visit during uh, phd days but there is some some very interesting elements of that system now that you have spent such a long time i am going to also come to the berkeley part which is right. also equally right. interesting uh, how was your experience sir because uh, it actually opens up the way you are thinking uh because the way it functions as a as a system is also very different the scientific establishment right. Right. could you please paint us a picture so so one of the things that now uh, having been away from there also for 10 years i i think i sort of understand is that they do build up their own aura oh. mm. uh, but it works as a positive influence mm. in the sense that you know you join the program uh, it's a cliche to say that you know americans tend to present very well and you know yeah. they they do uh, x and they show 5x mm. that sort mm. of thing but i think that's an unfair characterization mm. the, the mm. right thing is that they build up the task they are doing and stress its importance mm. Mm. and this is something that we you know maybe as indians now we do a bit better yes. we traditionally tend to underplay underplay yeah, absolutely and that's not nice so mm. it, you know they, they they work exceptionally hard mm. um my advisor never actually told me that you should come in on a saturday but he would come in on a saturday ah yeah, yeah and yeah. never ever has he ever brought this up when mm-hmm. you come in. come in but you see him you see other people who do this and he'll have some fun he'll come in only half a day friday go yeah, for a run yeah, come yeah. back spend some time it uh, convinced me that here is somebody who likes what he's what doing, he's doing. Yeah, right exactly. like he, yeah. he, this isn't a job you know he's pursuing this because it's his baby and, absolutely and he, right you absorb that message I, i think that is that's quite wonderful to see um, it's no longer thought of as a chore that chore, you, you exactly. come into work or i have to do this on a saturday no it's he's there by his own choice exactly exactly he, he wants to answer this question so 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 important such an important point what you're mentioning because that that drive is something great about uh, american yeah. system right you would you'd see that most of the places uh probably that is one of the reasons why they have done so well right i mean uh, yeah i agree i mean of course we we all know that the system has issues yeah, yeah you know, of course of course being underpaid yeah, and yeah. too too few faculty positions yeah, and so on yeah. but nevertheless what you said the reason for success is that they take it quite seriously Seriously. they if you take excellent people and you push them a little bit then you get really good really stuff. really good stuff yeah. and and maybe that doesn't work for the whole population but it does work for that subset absolutely uh, right that you know work well under being pushed you're absolutely um, right you're absolutely right so uh, how was your experience in the grad school like uh, you would have to take courses and then build upon from there or? so i had a years worth of courses and at that point rutgers had a qualifying exam mm. uh, which was all the physics <laughs> you ever learned in your life yeah <laughs> and so the exam was spread over 3 days um so let me think it was four problems each day wow. so you solved a total of 12 problems <laughs> yes. um and the exam was open ended in the sense that they gave you the question paper at 9 and you could sit there till 5 in the evening so somebody brought some pizza and fed you in the middle nice <laughs> and you do that um it was maybe not as hard as now i understand a lot of our indian exams are mm. um you know we, we are uh, we are quite tough on tough. students yeah, yeah i mean yeah. Uh, getting through an indian system you're already incredibly well prepared, well prepared yeah. I, I, your foundations are very solid mm. um even then i had colleagues who would come from like presidency for example oh. mm. and i was a bit in off of the amount of you know just ground level understanding Honestly. they had of very basics um uh, which maybe i didn't have necessarily absolutely uh, no in fact this is something very important what you're mentioning i uh, please continue please no no, no yeah, but yeah, now yeah. it's completely true right yeah. like in india we we stress on these things quite a lot we bemoan the fact maybe that we have less freedom mm. but those foundations we do really well uh, precisely see there is some element of our education which actually has worked okay because th- there is sometimes uh, sometimes too much of bashing know, <laughs> of, ex- exactly of, of our system because i, I understand there are certain big uh, kind of uh, lacunas which are there but uh, for example if you like take average math ability hmm. uh means i'm i'm no way telling that 
by conventional standards the country is doing great or something correct, like that correct but what i'm telling is people who have been reasonably well trained in schools right actually are exceedingly yeah. good competent yeah, better than competent com- yeah exactly, exactly. And so that was the thing right it's not like i went to a very fancy college or had yeah. a great physics exam mm. in hindsight i could have done more so mm. all of us of that age Same, yeah. we had annual exams yes, yes, right exactly <laughs> which meant that we could have done so much more in those 3 years but we weren't pushed to do it but i didn't uh, end up there and feel that you know i know less or i'm not competing and what not it, it was fine this is quite doable let's do this nice nice um, so the the one year of courses and then you pass the qualifying exam at which point they say that you're qualified and you can be a phd candidate yeah. uh, the day i got the result so for example a week after that so suni shipped me off to fermi lab ah oh, okay so okay. even within my my <laughs> six year phd i spent half the time at uh, fermi lab in chicago, chicago and that uh, was in new jersey so yes. that was kind of nice um, and two different cultures huh, also very different huh? in fact it ended up being quite interesting so because it was east coast the midwest was, and then berkeley uh, yes. east so you you so, spanned the whole yeah, i got a chance to work in all three places. wow wow very, that was very quite interesting nice. very interesting um, and uh, it is quite interesting because the the fermi lab was the first time i was at a place where it's not an educational institute yes. right it's a lab yeah, yes. and this is the first time i had ever been to yeah. actually a lab even in india i mean in hindsight i guess iuk is kind of like a lab yeah yeah, uh, yeah. but i hadn't made the connection yeah so i go there and then everybody is working on the same subfield oh, and yeah. everybody is a high energy physics yes. all the talks are high energy physics all the discussion is that that uh, was not intimidating it's actually quite liberating mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. see that whatever you are doing is popular enough that it's a thing you know, a lot of people are doing this yeah it's an establishment smart people are interested yeah. that gives some validation, validation. which is Absolutely. nice um, see that is one of the also great positives of particle physics i keep telling even in the various different right. uh, forums in physics kind of discussion that ab- that ability to build community and sustain yeah is unparalleled in yeah. my opinion that's right because that is their strength and it has resulted in some outstanding achievements right, right? right. probably that is something we should appreciate yeah, no, that that's really true yeah. i mean uh, the fact that you can have uh, now of course 3000 people on a collaboration <laughs> but even back then 500 600 um in some sense it's likening to you know having you know we say in hindi ki ek mayan mein do talwar no, no, exactly it's kind of hard to get 600 scientists together get them to agree on things and you know absolutely. live cohesively and friendly together absolutely but but it has worked i mean it's uh, a remarkable achievement yeah. for humanity yeah it, <laughs> at a day and age especially when we are you know fighting wars <laughs> over very yeah stuff that shouldn't actually result, result in, in uh, yeah. disagreement absolutely it's a nice model because now we see stuff like ligo sort of inherit this like how do i if i if a project requires the strength of 1000 people yeah we have a template that how can 1000 people work together work together, together. And, and absolutely and you know it cuts across cultures it cuts across so many diversities right, right. Uh, in that, fact that's really important you know that right. is something i i'm always amazed because uh, one thing of course the science is great but even the sociological aspect correct and i've seen so many people enjoying uh, yeah. i'm i'm going to come to the cern aspect which you yeah. are also yeah. involved in it uh, but now that you have uh, making a transition as you mentioned very nicely part of part in the east coast then into the midwest and then going all the way to the berkeley where you worked uh, uh, in uh, in uh, lawrence berkeley laboratory which actually is to our uh, listeners one of the labs yeah. in the, the world the birthplace of the cyclotron exactly. from the lot of this time exactly if yeah. somebody is uh, watched oppenheimer <laughs> right that's the guy that's, that's the, the guy, guy. Yeah. Uh, that that's the person we we are talking about here uh, things actually yeah. get initiated so tell us about that experience so, so uh, uh, after i finished <coughs> my uh, phd uh, i was looking for different post doc mm. positions and uh, there were several interviews that i managed to land so uh, the nice thing was because i was already in the us i, I got a chance to go and give talks mm-hmm. so that was good um but after i had the the berkeley offer then it was clear yeah. like, you have <laughs> yeah. to go there um a large part of it had to do with the fact that even historically that was yes. like the birthplace mm. they have a um i mean you know so many nobel prize winners yeah, there yeah. Uh, just the ability to spend some time in that environment i thought would be quite grand the interview of course went really well when mm. i was mm. there but i'll i'll share something interesting mm. so when i went for my interview they put me up in a local heritage hotel uh-huh. the hotel was really really nice uh-huh. 
but berkeley being this uh, and california you know, uh, conserve conserve things yeah. and what not there was a small little sign in the hotel room that says you know we, we like to conserve things don't waste water uh, uh. Uh, don't wash your i mean don't put your towel to wash if uh. you don't need it to which is very common nowadays yeah, yeah. and then i go and turn on the shower the shower is like a trickle because wow. they are conserving water Con- <laughs> there is zero pressure in the shower <laughs> and to be honest for me that's like a pet peeve and, and yeah. it caused me to think that you know if this is true everywhere then yeah. i would not going to survive this <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but it turned out that was just the heritage hotel it is hotel and that's very very interesting yeah uh, the the berkeley lab i mean aside from the academic stuff its its location is also quite yeah. fantastic yeah so i interviewed and then at the end of the day i was supposed to meet uh, this person carl haber who's quite an interesting scientist Uh, but he could also see that it's the end of the day and i'm sort of out of you know energy out of yeah. battery so he says okay you know we'll talk tomorrow but have you uh, seen our balcony he says say, yeah, okay i haven't yeah. he took takes me out there are these big double doors uh, mm-hmm. metal double doors he opens it's a small balcony but the view from from this is the entire bay area wow <laughs> so you see the ground sloping away you see you see berkeley you see the golden gate bridge san francisco on the other side and it's sunset because it's the end of the day right <laughs> it, it, i'm just sold at that instant like i have to come work here, here. <laughs> and then i waited desperately for a month till they made up their mind and they said okay we'll offer you the position nice so, nice so, um, that's remarkable i have similar experience not of course a longer period of time my first ever flight outside hmm. not just india but outside bangalore where i was born <laughs> brought up <laughs> very funny thing was to Uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> really, that was your first flight. Oh. The very first flight I am taking. Of course, it was through uh, Japan, right? Because you are going to the West Coast, and this is uh, during the PhD time. So I went for uh, I went to UCSB uh, to attend a, uh, a summer school that changed my whole perspective of the world. You know, because you, you, here I am. Actually, I have never taken a flight. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the first flight is. And yeah. I am taking my first flight that too in the old airport in Bangalore. <laughs> Where people are still strapping their <laughs> luggage. That's right. It was and and you you land in LA because that's the yeah. first point where you land and you see this. You would have probably seen this where there is a big billboard where uh, there is a silhouette of uh, of a uh, of the iPod thing. That's Ooh. a very famous uh, yes, this yes, thing, right? Yes, yes, yes. With, with the singer and with the, the singer, yeah, with yeah. the singer. And the, the, it's a photo of a uh, lady uh, who actually has this uh, uh, Head, headphone wires headphone coming wires coming down. that was iconic right yeah. you know and this yeah. is the first thing i'm seeing yeah. and the billboards what i'd seen in bangalore was no way and like, like you said i mean sometimes you need these moments to just open your open, eyes yeah, right yeah, like it's yeah. a whole new world absolutely yeah. absolutely so then uh, how how long were you in in berkeley so yeah. i was there in berkeley for four and a half years so that was also the time that uh, so my phd was actually on the tevatron mm. which was at fermi lab which was then the highest energy mm. collider mm. in the world After I moved to Berkeley, it was still a full year before the LHC started. Started, mm. and so I was doing some hardware projects mm. and, and working on an upgrade at that point. Um, so I was there for about four, four and a half years, um, and it was actually a very interesting time because, uh, so so because it was a lab, the postdocs at the lab did not actually have formal advisors. Mm-hmm. Um, in in the modern way of how we imagine a lab runs is usually it's a PI and maybe a couple of postdocs if mm. life is good and and several students, um, or if the postdoc is missing then it's one PI and many students. Mm. The lab culture on the other hand was that uh, it was like middle heavy, so mm. so there were mm. like you know ten twelve postdocs, maybe three four scientists. Mm. Um, of course, the UC Berkeley factory was also yeah, involved, well, well. Mm. but each person sort of in some sense competed for graduate students. Oh, okay. So instead of being a hierarchy, um, there would be like maybe six or eight students. Mm. Now the faculty member also wants to work with the student. The postdoc also wants to work, and most of the time uh, the postdocs would end up not getting a chance Chant to work. With work so they used to work with each other. Yes, yes. Uh, so for me, that was a bit of a transition. In in my PhD, uh, Sunil always had a lot of uh, students. Mm. So mm. I got a chance to work with a master's mm. student and an undergrad, mm. and with me mm. being the PhD student. So which is kind of normal how we yeah, do things. Yeah. After going there, it was the first time that it was me and two other postdocs. So we were all sort of equal, right? Nice. There's no hierarchy. Nice, nice. And so that was a nice thing to learn. You know, how do you, how do you get things done? And of course, if it's three postdocs, stuff gets done much faster. Much faster. That means uh, it's good for you, but it also means you're, you're, you know, you have to perform better. Perform better. Because you don't get that breathing time that with a student where okay, learn this and come back. Here, it's everybody knows everything, so you have to move fast. 
Fantastic. Um, yeah. Which is kind of at odds with the California culture. Uh, 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 and with due apologies to the the book eating, <laughs> they are very laid back. So I mean, you could tell this between the East Coast and the West Coast. The the first month I was there, Sven Vasen, who uh, was a senior postdoc, mm. um, of course, very accomplished at that point. Mm. But but I, I was new, and so he tells me on a Thursday, maybe four o'clock. Okay, I, I'm going to take a two three hour break. I'll come back at night. Uh, I'm going to go surf. <laughs> okay. And it was really interesting. Really. <laughs> Yeah, and on the East Coast you could never. Never do. Yes, yes. It's not going to happen. And forget about Midwest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's even slower. In Chicago so, and other places, you're you're actually overworking. Yeah, when you're, you're not going to be doing yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. But that was quite uh, nice. That mm. you know, they 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 were laid back. Um, they expected you to do excellent work, mm. uh, but it was your responsibility. Mm. So mm. it wasn't like there was an advisor who's going to push you and so on. Mm. So I have. I have mixed feelings about mm, it. Mm. I think, in hindsight, it may have been nice mm, mm. if I had had a, you know, a point person, one advisor mm, who's mm. going to guide, you know, mentor, mm, push mm. you a bit. At the same time, I enjoyed the idea of already being a bit independent. Independent, which would probably add uh, uh, into your uh, further helps. future experience of a faculty. Exactly. It helps okay. to plan for, you know, how we will work as a as exactly. A faculty member. Exactly. Um, wonderful. Wonderful. So now uh, you also visited CERN during that time. I right. Assume. So that that was the first time that I that I visited uh-huh. CERN. Uh, my first trip was already an elaborate one. So I got two weeks at CERN, I think. Then I went a week to Bonn, um, and then I came back and stayed at CERN for another week. So it, it was actually my first time visiting Europe. Oh, um, nice. I, nice. Never. Uh, that's not true. Maybe I had gone to Morion, which is hmm. in Italy a bit, hmm. but that's a conference. conference. You just live in the bubble yeah, and come home. Yeah. This is the first time that. Uh, Like especially coming from the US, you understand what a good public transport system yeah, should be. <laughs> no, you can actually rely on it. You know, yeah. stuff happens on time. Um, that that was an interesting experience. Experience. Mm. Um, very recently, we had this. Uh, we had Professor Ashutosh Kotwal from Duke who yeah, was visiting, yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, he's been at Duke for a long, long time. Mm, mm. Um, very quintessentially American, mm. you know, system person. But in this conversation <laughs> with him, he, he also brought this up. If you somehow you know are brought up in that system, it's hard to get used to CERN. CERN. So CERN is is it's a different environment. Um, of course, they work exceptionally hard, but somehow for a US person shifting into that environment, you feel a bit lost. Is it okay? Uh, okay. Some of it, I think, comes from the fact that CERN deals with uh, uh, diversity mm. in a different way than say the US does. Mm, mm. You know, we like to say the US is a melting pot. Yeah. Yeah. But what that melting pot, I think, even for me, meant at Fermilab was that you could be from wherever. You could be an Italian, mm. you could be whatever. Mm. We're going to do things together. We, we'll, you know, go get a beer together. Mm. If you're going to cook something Spanish, then we're mm. all going to be there, and, mm. and so on. Mm. At CERN, because the volume was larger, you could see that there were subgroups. Subgroups. Oh. There are Spanish people who, you know, stay with Spanish people. Oh. I mean, I, I may be exaggerating. Yeah. It's not yeah. really true. But for a person who just <laughs> came from the US, mm. it was a bit more obvious that, you know, these aren't Spanish people who moved to the US and hence must assimilate. Uh-huh, uh-huh. This is a person who's there just for two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. So, so of course they, you know, they gravitate transient. towards them. Yeah, <laughs> and and Indians as an Indian, yeah. I would you know gravitate towards yeah, yeah. Indian. It was quite natural. But that was a, a, a bit of a phase shift. Phase shift. You know, to, to see very interesting. Happen very differently. Yeah, that is a kind of theme which uh, I. Uh, i have also seen talking to many of the people on the podcast they tell that the the kind of work culture is very different right. of course from us to right. europe it has its own kind of you know interesting ca- so elements like, to it. you know you have a coffee at 4 o'clock and it's okay, okay. to take that half an hour yes, they yes. don't panic that you know okay we have been here sitting for yeah. and as i learned later like not necessarily in the first one trip but mm. subsequently you can do a lot of interesting <laughs> discussions at that 4 o'clock of you you don't have to stress, stress about, time. about time. like you know every half an hour doesn't mean that you have to be typing away or doing something absolutely right no. it's so so correct in fact a lot of uh, stuff happens <laughs> over, over L- like a 30 discussion. minute coffee break is actually much more productive than just a 10 minute 10 minute you, yes. you need that 10 minutes to unwind exactly. that's when the good ideas then the good ideas flow in fact since you're mentioning this there's a very very interesting kind of elaboration of this concept even in the in the chronicles of uh, bell labs ah. where uh, people like shannon and other people uh, in fact i learned about this from uh, hamings you and your research it's a famous mm, essay mm, written mm. 
uh, also very interesting but also little kind of you know Plain different the, yeah. very uh, different kind of an advice he gives there but there he exactly mentions that that uh, the kind of discussion what you have uh, with your colleagues on an informal basis right. including let's say a podcast exactly, exactly. <laughs> would actually uh, lead to some very interesting uh, directions which would have otherwise not explored at all yeah. right i yeah. mean it enriches you in ways that you don't anticipate anticipate uh, exactly. that's very important that's that so listeners that is the reason why conversation is important yes, yes. <laughs> no this is something which probably we have talked uh, yeah, sort of talked about this, and uh, yeah. we also tell that to our to our students that it's important to have an informal conversation on every work right. uh, what one does because formality is only a part of the world yes. right it's yes. the informal way is, is and and we I, like we both of us we do this like you know when you take tea with your students and it lasts for half an hour for two minutes I, I mean, my advisor was wonderful. He's mm. my friend. Mm. He, he's counselled me about everything that's completely personal, from me getting married when I was a PhD student. Yeah, yeah. But I don't remember a time when he said, "Let's go get a coffee or let's go get a chai." Mm. That's not a thing. Yes, yes. Uh, like a coffee break. He, they had it among the faculty. Okay, yeah, they yeah. would get together. But now I really appreciate that I do that with my students. students. There are good things that come out. You yeah, do it. Absolutely. It, it's a really nice culture nice to culture. have. It's a it's a great culture to have. It, it 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 actually also breaks all the barriers not only in terms of intellectual but also sometimes uh, the cultural barriers yes, too right yes. that is a report and in today where we are much more conscious of you know mental health issues yes, and things yes. how you create a good environment i think this really adds that's that, maybe yeah. that was not such a thing 10 15 years ago certainly not very when correct. we were doing phd so no, very correct. asked very correct yeah. so i want to just touch upon uh, the time when you got married mm -hmm. because uh, that's a unique aspect because i think i assume you were already married during your phd yeah i got married in the second second third yeah, year studio from it because there is a, see general notion especially among students it's a it's a point which is not very easy to resolve yeah because you can see uh, having worked with so many of our own students Correct. it's always a difficult point because that is another stress point for all of our uh, phd graduates right because uh, they are at a stage of their lives and more so unfortunately if they are uh, kind of women Right. Uh, there is a right. lot of pressure sometimes. I'm not telling generalizing yeah, it, but, but from uh, home, home and yeah, other things. How how did you manage, uh, sir? Of course, you you and Shraddha were uh, already uh, right. so we knew each other for a long time before yeah. then. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when I moved to my PhD, we we already had chalked out sort of a rough plan mm -hmm. that uh, sure we'll be apart for a bit, mm -hmm. but uh, in the next two or three years we should aim to get married. It of course helped quite a bit that uh, Shraddha knew what. She's mm, getting into mm, mm. Uh, graduate students are not rich. Yeah, um, yeah. Very at the bottom <laughs> end of the spectrum, uh, but it's still not. Uh, you know, people overestimate how much money you need to sort of enjoy life. Yes, I'm not even trying to do a cliche of you know yeah, yeah. happiness. You can do a lot of basic things. You know, you can walk out in parks. There yeah. are lots of free concerts, yeah. movies. There's you can live a full life without necessarily you know that much money, mm, and. Mm. Uh, Uh, my advisor at some later point he he uh, did tell me this that he was a bit worried when i got married that he felt yeah. i would get distracted mm. uh, but then when i graduated he came and said in your case it actually helped, it helped. yeah you you got you got very focused mm. um, you got disciplined in the sense that you know you knew that you had to go home at maybe 6 mm. and that meant that you you know did good planning yes, you yes. knew what you have to do you didn't uh, you know drift unnecessarily I certainly agree with that. Yeah, it was yeah. true that, and not as a pressure that you know, I I mm -hmm. married, I have a wife at home, I should do something. <laughs> it just it became routine. You routine. Know, it it yeah. became a sort of an adult thing. So it was it was nice. Wonderful, um, wonderful, great. So now this is uh, roughly about two thousand twelve thirteen when you are now making a transition, I suppose, right? Right. right. And uh, your kids were already born, or uh, right? So Arihan, yeah. I had. So I yeah. had one one uh, kid in two thousand nine. So he was three or four when we moved to India. Nice, nice. Um, and uh, actually i mean uh, aisar pune is a very very interesting place mm. I mean, you you were already here when i when i interviewed um uh, but you know we had a new chair sunil yeah. sunil mukhi coming in and and when i came as a guest uh, some spot they they put me in with prasad yeah. uh, who's a solar physicist yeah, yeah. so in his office uh, 
one of the concerns so see because i left after my bsc i didn't get a real chance to experience the academic environment in india in india yes yes and so the only things that i would know would be hearsay mm, and mm. as you know you know hearsay is always bad bad yes you know you yes, only yes. hear the bad you'll hear oh hear only the bad things yes and so for me i was a bit apprehensive about coming here and yeah. you know, interacting it's exactly the same <laughs> environment as the us yes, yeah. or or sir i mean Yeah. Professional scientists are the same as you. Same as yeah. They all worry about the same things. They are yeah. extremely driven. Yes. They all care about their research, and they are they are usually very friendly. Yes. I mean, uh, and of course, your Prasad is even more. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So Prasad and Sudarshan took me uh, out to nice. uh, to to lunch that day. Uh, um, so, I think that was. I mean, it had me sold on the idea. Nice, nice. Being from Pune, it yeah. was quite natural to mm-hmm. have this uh, opportunity to work in Pune. Actually, it turned out that uh, if you know Professor Jemis, who, who yes. was the ICER, ICER Trivandrum, yes, yes, he had visited Berkeley and he had made a presentation about ICERs that have started in uh, India, uh-huh. and he had shown a faculty hiring projection, mm. which was we'll do twenty this year and then twenty five <laughs> the next year and thirty the year after, <laughs> and in the audience, you know, being used to the US system, all of us were looking at that. Are uh-huh. you off by a factor of ten? Like, should it be like two <laughs> and three? And then he laughs and he says, "No, I mean these institutes it's are coming, coming up. up. Yes, um, yes. There's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. So that already had uh, sold me a bit on the idea Maybe. of, of you know, yeah, and whatnot. Wonderful, wonderful. Because see that uh, transition time, 2013, post 2010, uh, they the ICERs actually were coming up, right. and uh, the, the final of, campuses were sort of not, almost ready. Almost and, ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's a kind of very nice time." Great experience because you literally are in a room and the whole institution is in the room. <laughs> exactly, started, right? exactly. And it was a wonderful uh, ecosystem. I mean, it, it's an incredible opportunity to get in and try to influence and you know be able to build up something together. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. I, so then you finally make a transition, right? At to twenty thirteen, twenty thirteen, and uh, how was it? Like you were able to move smoothly because you are coming back to Pune, correct, so your correct. familiarity was good. So one of the things was uh, uh, before I moved, there were a couple of other people who had also moved from uh, the the US hmm. to India. One was a friend from the East Coast; he is still in Pune. Hmm. Uh, the other is uh, so so Professor Pratik Sharma at uh, ISC. ISC, oh yeah, yes, he, yes, he's an astro- astrophysicist. Yes, yes. So he uh, Pratik and his wife Asha used to also be in Berkeley. He was a nice, Berkeley postdoc right. then, so we knew them very well. He moved the year before me. Mm, mm. Uh, I don't know if he explicitly said it ever, but the advice that comes is that don't think of it as going back to India. Mm. It's just you're going to India, and this is true. When I was applying for faculty positions, I remember I had applied to a place in. I mean, mm. so, so Sussex also had applied. Uh-huh. Um, mm. I didn't get called for an mm. interview there. But if you tend to think of the move as you know, as scientists, we are used to moving anywhere. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. okay, so you move to Pune. That helped quite a bit because then you don't try to fit in this place with your imagination, imagination of what it should exactly. be. Exactly, you're quite open to the idea. You discover things. A lot of things we had to re- rediscover. You exactly. know, all the restaurants are new. Yeah. <laughs> all the roads are new. Yeah, everything yeah. is new again. So absolutely, absolutely. That was nice. Yeah, um, when I go back to Bangalore, I can't yeah. re- imagine where I where I grew yeah. up. In fact, that's it's a similar experience. Different. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely wonderful. So, uh, sort of. Now we have uh, kind of covered kind of your trajectory. Uh, we're going to just shift a little bit towards your research. Hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what is your current research interest? What is your group looking into? Hmm. Tell us about your research group too. Hmm. Uh, it would be nice to know uh, uh, what what kind of directions you people are taking. Yeah. Um, so uh, ever since my PhD, the kind of stuff within particle physics that I've been doing is searching for uh, you know physics beyond the standard model. Mm, is called. Mm, mm. So this is stuff that is uh, you know where we have theoretical prejudices or some experimental evidences that say that the current understanding is not good enough. Mm-hmm. We need something else. Um, that is something that has been a theme throughout uh, from my PhD e- even now. One of the things about CERN, especially in the last uh, the LHC in the last few years. Mm. Has been that the the size of the data set is so incredibly large um, in a very short time. So this is one of the things that I think is really important. What happens is, as as with all scientists, mm. we usually work towards some immediate goals. You know, there is a big conference coming up, and I need something for there, mm. or I have a student that has to graduate, and you know, so so you sort of draw some lines that okay, this is enough because the student needs to graduate, or this is enough. Um, This has happened, I think, a little bit on a slightly larger scale with CERN. So, 
this year you collect a lot of data and and there are big you know the big ticket okay. items big, that you yeah, need to do yeah. so you do all of those and next year you collect even more data so you move to that yeah. and then mm. you move to something else this does mean that sometimes i have this personal fear that you know of the data that you've collected have you really wrung it dry mm. have you done everything that you could conceivably do with it if for example you had no data coming in mm. Mm. then would you not have spent a lot more time, time with, with it? it okay um so lately i've been thinking about this quite a bit mm-hmm. and uh, so so you know some of it comes with having some career security mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. around 2018 i got tenure um before i got it i had imagined you know i remember talking to you yeah. also about this you imagine that nothing's going to change but slowly, slowly it does it change does. Yes, and, yes. and you know that security i get it like you know now you're quite willing to do something that there's no obvious reward yeah yeah it's yeah. like it's fine this is a long term plan. plan and you mean it like, you mean it exactly yeah no problem four years it's okay you know we, we'll get there that's that, exactly what academic uh, kind of uh, careers give you right because yeah. see i'm not telling it's going to change anything big Correct. but the kind of uh, reorientation is very yes, important yes. Yeah, yeah and and you see that you have like another 20 years of career left to pursue this exactly yeah. so you know y- you can think <laughs> of like these big mm, things mm. um so so right so we we do these beyond standard model searches mm. um these typically happen in two different ways one in which uh, there is already a pre existing thing that you're searching for like there is a model this is a thing and you you devise something to search for it at the same time uh, because there are many many such new models mm. and uh, even with our theoretical colleagues they've done their bit you know they have like 25 30 ideas mm. now, now mm. they're waiting for the experiment to sort of give them some yeah, feedback mm. which means that we have to be uh, inventive with how we look for stuff you know uh, there used to be this story that uh, i don't know if it's uh, it's either akbar birbal or sheik chilli mm. where uh, you know there's a guy under a lamp and he's looking for looking something for the, uh, and you ask him you know i lost my ring i lost it there but i'm <laughs> but looking for it here because this is where the light <laughs> is I, i think we need to do that like in particle physics we need to turn on more of these lamps yeah. you know we we keep looking in places that are easy to look nice nice um, so now i'm sort of transitioning a bit towards doing uh, more of these model independence mm-hmm. studies which means that you just look at the data and see if you find any anomalies anomalies mm. you don't care if a particular theoretical motivation exists for mm. this anomaly nice nice um, you have to i mean there is a social sociological aspect you have to balance it against the fact that students still need to write good papers Paper, yeah, yeah they need to understand uh, how to derive things and how in what direction to go um but i feel more free in the fact that uh, you know i know how to manage it better now mm. you know mm. 10 years into the thing at least now you are i'm less stressed that how will a student graduate it's like yes you know stuff happens it will work out uh, wonderful wonderful you can sort of feel more relaxed about taking on new interesting things absolutely that's but, actually an important honest, element, but, yeah. but a lot of things there come from being you know for example uh, there are a lot of good places in india but even at iisr pune this is true i find for a lot of my colleagues that you know they are willing to take on new stuff new you know stuff, you, yes. you talk to somebody they are quite willing to say that well now i've decided to do this one yes, we'll yes. see what where it goes um which is actually a very helps. very good thing very That's good a thing very because good thing. some of our colleagues have also kind of got into entrepreneurial aspect of the work and exactly and, and, and thing, all yeah. of this is an avenue that you you know it creates a conducive environment to do these long shot short, short of studies absolutely right absolutely right so in that sense the kind of ecosystem what you or have actually moved into but also you have created an ecosystem i i would want to elaborate on that a little bit more first i'm going to kind of ask you a little bit more about a uh, way you have built your own group hmm. you know you have a uh, kind of a great set of students from the past and also current set uh, whom we actually i know a little bit about right. uh, i have seen that uh, that element of uh, you know transition or rather the kind of transfer of information not only information but the thought process right. has been very effective because uh, many of effective. yeah right. many of your students have gone on to do very well in very right. good, good places But what has been your kind of view point of building the group sort of so of course some of this evolves quite a bit right on day one yeah yeah uh, it's interesting if i ask a junior faculty and and i think back to when i was um, you think you know a lot <laughs> and then you know 10 years later you know you yeah, did it. and i'm quite sure in 10 years we'll look we'll back look at this right. and yes. like well that was nice yeah, yeah. we'll do another podcast exactly exactly <laughs> um 
uh, sometimes when I talk to Shraddha about this, mm. it, it's interesting to convey the idea that, um, I mean, in no sense uh, am I equating this to, you know, like, like armies or whatever. Yeah, but but yeah. what I mean is that the bonding that one needs uh, is actually quite deep. Mm. If you have good bonding with your students, what can happen then is that, uh, A, they build up a trust in what you're saying. Mm. Many a times you need them to do something difficult yes. because you know it's you the right know. thing. Yes, yes. A and and they don't see a direction. They feel, but I'm not going to get anything out of this. Mm. It's taking too long. You need them to just trust you. When they do that work after trusting you, as opposed to just doing it because you're telling you're them, it's a sea change. Yeah, it's right? a very big thing. If they do it out of trust, they really do a good job. Yeah, at absolutely. It. absolutely. And, and I think that is, I mean, See, a lot of it is just fortune. Sometimes, you know, you're fortunate to get good students, mm -hmm. you click with them. Uh, but I think one should also actively <laughs> try to uh, get to know them as people. Absolutely. You know, they have their own strengths and, and you and I have talked quite a bit yes, about this. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this does inform how how we do a lot of things. You know, you, you understand that for a person, something is difficult. You know not to sort of say that I'm going to hammer this. Hammer this. It's okay. That's not their strong suit. And they, they excel at something else. Then that takes us in that other direction. Uh, direction. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It also is, you know, in academics when you're building a group, uh, you are essentially kind of uh, building a garden with a large tree, and uh, you are essentially facilitating other small shrubs to actually grow underneath the, that tree, right? Because you, that's uh, exactly uh, true, yeah, right? Yeah. right? Because you essentially form a slightly more, I would not even call it permanent structure, because as a tree. In a garden is also not a permanent thing. But you're right, right? Like you know you are going to be there for a long, long time. Long time, yes. You you need to grow, mm. right? You know, ultimately you want your career, your research exactly. agenda to exactly. thrive. Exactly, yeah. But at the same time, it's a framework in which many shrubs are going to grow. Absolutely, right. Yeah. Because that, then uh, it's not like you are, you are, you are actually out uh, probably having a branch. In fact, I, I would like to look at it as some small shrub which is growing in that garden. Just that you are probably providing some correct, umbrella correct. for or a, or a canopy of that kind. So, which also brings me to the point that uh, that you also are not only an experimentalist, but also a person who is very well versed in computation. Probably it also goes back to your interest a long, yeah, exactly. long time ago. And uh, there is also some courses which you are now kind of offering, including uh, something related to machine learning right. and other things. Tell us a little bit about that. So. Uh, in particle physics, we've had machine learning for the mm. longest time since yeah. my PhD days. But actually, that was uh, while it was there, it was slightly harder to get into, and also there was a cultural aversion amongst uh, you know some scientists to necessarily absorb it. Um, I think a bit of that cultural aversion remains, but people have become more open to the idea of at least trying it out and, and then coming. So let me say that a, a bit better. Mm. What I mean is that usually a machine algorithm, machine learning algorithm is a black box. Mm. You apply it to a problem, it gives you A versus B or something. And a lot of physicists don't like the fact that I don't know what the box is doing. Mm. Right? How does it know? Why couldn't I come up with this? Um, initially, the issue used to be that this means that let's not even use the box. Mm. Now, mm. at least they're okay with the idea that fine, let's use the box. We'll try to probe the box from different ways and figure out what it is. Nice. A big part that has happened is, uh, you know, all these big data companies like Google and mm -hmm. Amazon and uh, all of them and, and the scientists there, they also put out a lot of open source stuff. Nice. nice. This means That's that there's nice. a lot of these tools that us as a physicist can use to see inside the black, black box. box. Nice. And, and that's good. So it has solved both of those together. I would say that the, the big shift for me for machine learning has happened maybe in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when the first... Uh, LHC stuff I was going to do was done. Mm. Um, I, I mean, okay, so the thing was my, my postdoc was in the Atlas experiment. Mm. And then when I moved here, it was CMS. The first few years in CMS were spent on again building up a bit, understanding CMS and doing that. Then with that freedom in the last four years, maybe uh, I said, okay, I, I have liked computing. Mm. And, mm. and uh, the barrier for entry for machine learning has gone down. Mm. At the same time, now it's much easier to find smart students who want to we do want it. To, yes. and, and they know it already. Already they have an uh, exposure to that. So, so all of that has sort of nicely come together where mm. we now try to do a lot of these fun little projects. So, for example, recently I have a student who's going to do machine learning 
uh, in a generative way. Mm. So you know this Dali, for example, mm. where you give a prompt yeah. and then a picture comes picture up. Ka. <laughs> uh, it turns out that Skype has a native agent that does this. So mm. I, I use Skype heavily with my group. Yeah, yeah. So in Skype also, there's a Skype bot where you can tell it, hey, give me a picture of a unicorn or yeah, a skateboard. Yeah. And it gives you that, yeah. which means that it's become very easy, easy to do this. Yeah. It's not only like a big company that does this. So with this student, this is what we are working on, to have a generative way to do simulation of collisions. Nice. It's limited in scope, so it's not going to do everything. But the one piece that you want done well, it's going to do a lot of. Oh, I mean, and so this is a nice thing. Maybe it's going to go somewhere. Fabulous. Um, Fabulous. So what element of uh, training is required sir, for this kind of work? So uh, originally, I, I, so okay, so yeah. separately, I, I really enjoy training students yes, in, in yes, particular yeah, physics. Yeah, I yeah, do a lot of yeah, these workshops yeah. and so on. Uh, now I have a good set of tutorials or steps or whatnot to get somebody started in, in machine learning. Wonderful. Um, in fact, uh, so our colleague Sachin Jai yeah, has yeah. been wanting to do this. Yes. He, he's like a polymath. Yeah. He wants to do everything. <laughs> so he came and asked me that, yeah. you know, how can I get started in this uh, machine learning? Uh, so I sent him some stuff. I hope uh, he finds it useful. Nice, nice. Uh, the the initial steps were uh, an affinity for computers mm. and somehow you know the world does divide into some people who you know see people will have mental blocks for various kinds yes, of things yes sometimes some people have mental block to programming mm. Mm. if you have that then it's a bit hard, hard. Right? you, you yes. need to move past that past somehow that. Absolutely. But see, I mean, you're an experimentalist. You know this very well that there are people who have just a mental block to doing something with yes, their hands. Yes, right? yes. You just have to get past it. Absolutely. Nice. Uh, nice. That's actually become an important uh, part of education yeah. nowadays uh, because uh, obviously uh, l learning math is fundamental, yeah. but learning to compute is yeah. as important nowadays yes. as uh, doing yes. uh, for basic mathematics, especially as you mentioned earlier, uh, algorithmic way of looking at things. Like, is an important uh, element in, in doing this. Because once you see that, you, know, you, you see the algorithmic thinking in all aspects. Yes. Now, when I look at a recipe for, say, cooking, you know, baking a cake, yeah. you, you see the see steps. Exactly. You understand what you can replace and what not. So, ah, so, so correct. This is actually a very, very important point what you're, you're making. Uh, if I understand correctly, you are also associated with data science department, right? Here in, in, uh, in not, not actually so much anymore. No much. Okay. So, so, in the initial days, yes, yeah, but, yeah. but lately, not, not so much. Yeah. Um, in some sense, a large part of what I do is data science. Yeah. So, so all of the basics of data science, such as you know, how do you visualize data? Yeah. How do you uh, pre-build it before you can draw meaningful mm -hmm. conclusions? Mm -hmm. yes. So for me, a favorite example that I do with students who are just starting out is to explain to them how census is. Mm -hmm. right? In the census, you collect a lot of data. Exactly. But then for that data, you can ask 20 different mm -hmm. questions. Absolutely. You can ask how does you know wealth correlate with education? How does you know, latitude, latitude correlate in India right. with uh, the schools are good or not, which means the data collected is the same. But what sort of questions you can ask of it, and how you would go about answering go about doing it? That that is uh, the nice thing. Uh, very very important component. One of the things, if you also have uh, observed the listeners, is that when we are talking about research, the teaching is already kind of <laughs> evolving just, out of it, just so, inbuilt into it. Inbuilt yeah. into it. So sort of. I have observed, and this is something everybody knows in, in the institute, that there are so many undergraduate students who have got trained under it. You know, <laughs> which is actually one, yeah, bit, yeah, because that is one of the important agendas of an institute such as That's Indian right. Institute of Science, education and research. That's right. uh, as our colleague Sutir always keeps telling, we take education very seriously. In yes, yes. <laughs> because really uh, right. research yeah. is important, but when you blend it with education, right. it really creates interesting magic. What has been your experience, uh, Saurabh, in, in interacting with undergraduates who are, some of them are really outstanding yeah. and some of them have varied interest and you have actually kind of seen a, a, almost a small sea of humanity. Right. And what has been your experience? So, I, I think some of it comes from a, a lot of us didn't get this, right? Many of us went to university mm. at mm. a time when the culture had already changed. Mm. We didn't see as much research when we were doing bachelors and it was all left to us. Absolutely. Um, at a place like ISER where we have a lot of these undergraduates and, and many of them are, you know, exceptionally smart, a lot of exposure, you know, know what they want to do and mm. are willing to take a lot of pains. Uh, you know, they have like a full day and then they'll still come and do an extra yeah, yeah, hour of yes, work. Yes. Uh, for me, I think that has been quite rewarding. Like, you know, as all teachers know, you talk 
to students uh, and if you see you know you convey an idea to uh, them when you uh, see the spark in their eyes that is an incredible incredible reward, reward. absolutely and absolutely. here we get the opportunity of working with very driven young people and and i think that is you know if there are colleagues who don't take an advantage of that i feel sorry about it mm, like, you know mm. it's easy for us to feel that uh, a particular undergrad doesn't know enough to contribute that is many a times true but what we are getting out of that interaction is not uh, help in our research mm. what it is getting us it's getting us motivation into why we why do. we do what yeah. we do very well put very well put yes and, and so that that really is what you feed off of absolutely so, you know you you teach enough people the same few basics and in your head it has now you know something has sparked but, why this have to be this way absolutely. can i try something else absolutely uh, because see uh, you you are making a very important point it is not what you gain for your research program but it is actually the research program reaching out to people right yes. because uh, there yes. is an inversion there yes and uh, it creates some kind of a, an, an outreach Yes. not only in terms of education it's a it's a literally a research outreach right <laughs> it's what you started off saying right yeah. it's the way of thinking that you're putting, putting out there yes. uh, that is quite uh, interesting mm -hmm. and it is reverse enriching as well right i mean uh, if you talk to a lot of new people each of them manages to tell you something that you know either they question your method yes uh, sometimes you know a thing that has worked for four students just doesn't work with the student absolutely and that's incredible for you you're like okay why doesn't it work work what how will this person learn absolutely right i mean on the same topic so uh, i'm also you know helping out in these two projects on uh. the copi of this irise and yes Energy, yes yeah uh, which are these teacher yes. training pedagogical sort of projects yeah can you expand irise for our listeners um, maybe i may not be able to do that yeah, yeah, yeah. so so <laughs> the idea behind the irise project is that it's a joint partnership between uh, department of science and technology and a few corporate entities so nice. tata technologies british council royal society of chemistry mm -hmm. in icer we've always had a lot of outreach right? yes. professor shashidhara earlier used to lead a lot of efforts yes yes hari harinath chakrapani who's now the pi yes, yes. also also did a lot of this as did a lot of us in our personal capacities yes. you know we, yes. we did this you know the exciting science group yes group yes so, a, a guru so and other that. people yeah. Yeah. so that culture has always been here based on that what these companies felt was that if we pool a lot of resources together can we take on something mm -hmm. bigger mm -hmm. and that's where the irise program was was born so one aspect is train school teachers a second aspect is to do something for early career mm -hmm. researchers mm -hmm. um, and then a thought leadership forum yeah, which is yeah. where you know uh, you get a bunch of experts in their fields come together and write white papers for me the teacher training part has been i mean so far we've done a lot of work there and has been the most eye opening yes yes all all of us who are faculty we don't do bed for example yes, right so we yes. never really taught how to teach we just yeah, learn yeah. as we go along and this is a good excuse for for me to see a little bit of that mm. um spend considerable thought trying to think that okay why does somebody learn something, learn something. In, a, in a way uh, a large part of it is that the icer uh, ecosystem has helped in the following way when we teach courses here we have a lot of freedom mm -hmm. uh, we are allowed to do exams in the way we exactly, feel when yeah. we teach labs we get to devise how many vivas yes. what i can ask so in some sense that is already our test we, we, we test out a lot of our ideas there so unlike a regular college i think we although we may not have training in education we we learn quite fast because fast, you know yes. naturally we experiment naturally we try out different strategies this now feeds back into the irise program in that you know we can go back there and say that look you need to give freedom to students exactly. they need to discover facts for themselves or if somebody does something with their hand they remember it better than you teaching them and so that sort of flow flow is really good. absolutely right absolutely see this element of freedom in teaching yeah see generally when we talk about research ecosystems we tend to tell oh you should give more freedom for people to do research correct but correct. it is equally important to give freedom to teachers to yeah. way uh, the way they want to teach yeah. because that makes a lot of difference makes right a lot of difference yeah. and even for students if they see a rigid thing right a lot of students will give feedback that you know you should follow a textbook exactly and do this i see why you know they would prefer that what sometimes they don't appreciate is that when it's i mean i wouldn't say it is uh, directionless but it is when it is super flexible mm. it gives them that ability to build a framework, framework yes. and and you know, to delve into something a bit more delve into something a bit less see the amount of knowledge is infinite 
no matter how many courses Absolutely. you do, you're not going to master not it. Going to master. The more important thing is how to how learn. Learn right? how to learn, and it goes back to the point which we discussed. The information is no more on a premium. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. because the um, of course there is some kind of uh, basic necessity of an internet. Right. Uh, but uh, if somebody is giving you the right kind of information, it's not difficult to go and figure out yeah. something. But you have to now tell what are the aspects you may have yes. to really think yes. about, and how do you gain kind of uh, information and convert that into knowledge, skill, etc. Et I mean, any course we think of, you will probably find a YouTube version of exactly. it, or a Coursera version, yeah, or an Intel version. And maybe done in a slightly more, you know, With more graphics, graphics and more and animation. Exactly, yeah, we done exactly. better. Correct. So our job has to accordingly shift a little. Shift bit. a little bit. Exactly. There should be kind of a reorientation. Yeah. And uh, in fact, ICER is a great uh, place to experiment that kind. Right. And as you clearly mentioned, that the flexibility of where you want to teach your course right. is probably one of the most important elements. I think I, I assume even IITs and uh, other places Possibly too have also this. also yes. have yes. this. Correct. Uh, but uh, given that our numbers are not as large as right. IITs. Uh, and uh, we don't have to orient people only to certain kind of correct, uh, uh, aspects. Correct. It gives us a slightly uh, kind of broader perspective. Uh, person. It's an advantage, right? Like uh, as an individual faculty, you can experiment and get something out of yes. it. Yes. If it had been a thousand people, then you it had have to be more of a program. Program, exactly. And yeah. then progress by committee is always slower. Right? <laughs> like an individual does it quicker. Absolutely, faster. absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I I second that point <laughs> completely. So now. We got to kind of also move a little bit for, uh, further and uh, expand this thought process from the 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 local uh, kind of uh, uh, community to slightly more broader community. Uh, one of the aspects which is very interesting, as we mentioned uh, in particle physics, is the community uh, which actually is so wide, and also the expertise is deeply embedded in the Indian system. Yeah. In fact, I learned of having interacted with you and many of our particle physics colleagues is that the particle physics has very deep roots in Indian universities. That's right. Uh, and that is actually very interesting and important uh, part of uh, any kind of physics education. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about how the community in particle physics has grown that way? So, uh, you know, all the time, of course, you know, many of us, the, the good institutes in India, if you point to TIFR mm. springs to mind, ISE springs mm. to mind. Um, so, for a long time, TIFR obviously has had a particle yeah, physics yeah. group, both experiment and theory. <laughs> But but even for me to learn very early on that Punjab University, for yes, example, exactly. That, that's for always the in my longest mind. time from the Kolar Goldfield mm, experience mm. all the way from back then they've had a thriving experimental programming particle. Absolutely. Um, not not to knock on it, but given how resource resource poor India was, it was I understand a bit easier for theory mm, research mm. to develop more. Um, and that has also led to certain issues with you know the the. It's nice for the theorists, like the culture is strong, good information is passed on, good attitudes are passed on, that's true. Mm. We've talked about this, for experimentalists, yeah. we have to struggle a bit and it's up to us to now build that up now that we have some resources. Um, but these universities, because they've had experience from the beginning, they, they've had these cultures, they know how to build stuff, they know what it takes to build a detector in a huge complex, they know what to do it for tabletop, tabletop experiments. Tabletop. Um, and, and this is nice because they can draw on a lot of experience that, uh, I mean, frankly, in condensed matter, for example, a lot of people build instruments. Yes, yes. It's very common to imagine a student starting off first build, then collect then data, collect data. Yes, then write yes, paper. Yes, you're right. At a place like CERN, for example, that is less true yeah, because yeah. data is coming in. Um, to be honest, I am not sold on the idea that every individual needs to build a part yeah. of the data, right? Yeah. Because there are too many things to do. Yeah. I have had students who, for example, have better orientation towards statistics, statistics yes. or better orientation towards writing better software. Mm, mm, mm. That is equally important, important. To, to building something, especially if you're you know keeping a large enterprise going. But this in, in the Indian ecosystem for a long time, however, the issue was I don't know how, for example, personally, why Punjab University mm, started yeah. or, or Delhi University. Yeah, Delhi University also. Long has, time yeah. exceptional yeah. experimental yeah. particle physics. And then why it didn't percolate maybe necessarily much more widely. Mm. In pieces here and there, we've had this at, uh, for example, Allahabad, Allahabad has, yeah, had, yeah. has had this. Um, it has been there here, here, here and around. Mm. Some Calcutta of, University also, yeah, if I'm correct. Right, exactly. Uh, uh, now there is a nice little cluster there that is uh, yes, know, Sahai Institute ah, and VCC yes, and you know yes, all yes, together. Yes, yeah. uh, 
at some point i think what happened is there there was enough money and as well cern was also coming mm. up and, and cern is closer to india yeah, than yeah. actually the us was which means you can imagine traveling right, yeah. um people have closer ties uh, just broadly i think the indian science system has has a lot of deep ties to like germany yes know, yes italy and traditionally so for a very long time very long it's time. not only recently and this is why having cern there is very helpful because yeah. now the collaboration is much richer yeah, you know, absolutely back and forth and, and that's really absolutely. nice so maybe around again 2008 2010 12 a, a lot many more institutes sort of you know yeah. grew like it grew a bit not exponentially but certainly factor of 2 it, it sort yes. of was there um and with a lot of new places new places so where that helped was that in a new place usually everybody is new so the management is new mm. uh, the faculty members come is new so they are quite willing to try out stuff stuff they yes. they are willing to not be bound by traditional rules that look we've never done this yeah, yeah. or look this will be very difficult to do from india you know the, the negative thoughts are less people are like okay i used to do this wherever yeah, i was a yeah. postdoc i'll do it here yeah, yeah. nice and that trial is important absolutely um, and, and, right. and they end up doing that that sort of i think helped the indian uh, experimental particle physics thing grow quite a bit fabulous uh, fabulous uh, so this this part is actually the positive aspect of it uh but if you also look at slightly more broader mm. elements there are two things i would want to emphasize uh, one is uh the participation of uh, women in physics has been a very worrying thing yes, yes. there's also statistics which to back that thing yeah uh that is one kind of uh, aberration which we may have to really yes. you know kind yes. of look into the second part is also the general support uh, a a young researcher gets and i'm not talking about uh, faculty members here i'm no, talking about no everybody from uh, from yeah. student travel so, yeah. money postdoc yeah. stuff, you know, stuff you know, yeah. so there are there is a lot of room for improvement yeah. uh what are your thoughts uh, sir of how how means of course there is no one size fits all Correct. kind of solution neither Correct. there is a very straightforward trivial Correct. answer to this Correct. but what are your thoughts because it is an important question i think so right. and uh, if you can give us a little bit about so if your, i think the first part first about about you know a broad lack of women yeah. uh, in science and i am embarrassed to say this but like for the longest time i would not have necessarily thought about this hmm. issue and and you know given it any deep thought um it's only after maybe having been a faculty member for 2 3 years is when you actually see it first hand yes. why are there only four men here and 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 you you know it's easy to start by assuming that i am not biased my system is not biased my process is not biased yes yes but if the end result keeps throwing up the same, same thing, thing at yeah. some point you have to examine that okay maybe you don't know what it is but clearly something uh, is absolutely amiss. absolutely um it is a problem we need to solve uh, i think part of it is is active outreach in the sense that okay so for me personally one one you know there, there's this religious thing that um it's a joke that mm. if you have a you know a society of buffaloes then their god will look like a buffalo uh-huh. mm-hmm. um <laughs> to, to bring that analogy here you need to see someone of your own kind for you to feel that this is doable yeah if i look back to when i was starting off to do physics if you only hear about feynman mm. and einstein right. yeah. you don't yeah. connect right connect. it's nice they're big scientists but you don't necessarily see yourself in those shows. those shows yes as opposed to if you see your neighborhood chacha is also a scientist yeah, yeah. then it becomes much more real you want yeah. to do this i think one thing that could help to do with this with, with the women thing is if enough women we can showcase mm, if you mm. put it out there that this is a viable, viable career path yeah. and put in place some systems to support the problems that come up you know obviously child care is one yes yes uh, moving with your husband is unfortunately in india cultural thing yes, you know, yes. it's very patriarchal Patriot, so you yeah, yeah. assume that the woman is going yeah, to move yeah. um speaking on on that it's it's sort yeah. of a side yeah. but uh, so my younger son he is now in the fourth grade uh-huh. in their social studies uh, they have this discussion apparently now of uh, how family structures change if there is a divorce wow okay they have uh-huh. questions or, or in class uh-huh. their teacher will discuss aspects like if the wife uh, if the husband dies then the wife will continue taking care of his parents uh. if the wife dies then the husband will continue taking care of her parents uh. and this is a thing that they discuss in wow. class wow oh, that's, that's that's amazing they have this 
this that's is amazing. something that has introduced between Arihan and Sahil. Like in that four year gap, this new aspect has come up. That's uh, unheard of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah at so least I, that I'm was not part of my education. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? so, so I'm very happy that I think, uh, you know, a bunch of these small changes, it's a slow process. Slow process. But they will sort of. Sort of. Uh, very interesting. The, the support for younger people uh, is a much harder, harder challenge. Thing. Yeah. Um, we we always hear of the PhD students agitating for uh, more money, for uh, example, and and I, I really honestly think that they're, they're still underpaid. Uh, right? Yeah, same here. Same uh, here. The kind of you know they are the ones who actually do the science. If they are happy, well paid, and secure, you know they, they get to marry, they get yeah. to have a life. Yeah, yeah. They will perform at a much higher level. Um, at the same time, I also see that you know why that happens. Mm, it, mm. So okay, so the analogy, if you make the analogy with uh, you know how much money should say a movie star make for mm, a movie, mm, mm. there is no right answer. It's whatever somebody will pay for it. Yeah. In the same way, I think in our society, if a large part of the audience is going to much rather pay for a Arjit Singh concert mm. than say you know pay for for research, that's why Arjit Singh gets paid more yeah. than a researcher. It's yeah. because that's what the society, society at large wants. Yeah. 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 That means then that a large part is us doing enough outreach mm -hmm. to convince, convince society us. that this is equally important. Absolutely. Uh, I think, I mean, this is not true. A lot, a lot of us do a lot of outreach, mm -hmm. um, and we but we should do a more of more it. of it. Yeah. We we need to make sure that society doesn't see us as in some ivory tower. Yes, you know, yes. our our day to day stuff gets communicated, communicated to, 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 to that particular part of it. You're absolutely right. And this is where you know stuff like this podcast is very helpful. Like you know, you yeah. have to humanize science. It is. Yeah, you know, it's people doing it. Yes, yes. Yeah, in fact, one of the uh, common elements, uh, if you look at it, uh, there are severe problems uh, of young people working in science, not only in India. For example, if you look up uh, uh, kind of even uh, uh, coverage in uh, nature and the science related to careers and uh, yeah, especially the US, US exactly. yeah. especially the postdocs ha are uh, undergoing huge yeah. amount of pressure yeah. uh, and uh, uh, th there and is some element unheard of to have somebody do 8 years 10 years of yes. simply because there are no positions no, no positions yeah. and other things we are missing out something very very yeah. crucial here i think so yeah. um, even in indian situation of course uh, the pr problem still persists uh, more so at, an, uh, at a phd uh, right, uh, kind right. of uh, student level so, so yeah. one thing I'll say there is that it, uh, I, I've had about four students yeah. graduate, uh, four PhD students. Mm -hmm. Two of them have now uh, actually after postdoc have transitioned to industry. See, yeah, that's uh, that's very. One is yeah. in the UK, so maybe that is less surprising because you know ecosystems there allow yeah. that. But one of them is actually in India mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. because it's a bit data sciencey, it's mm -hmm. a bit easy transition to imagine. But I think that is also uh, something that will really benefit. If more of industry, uh, not in in a specific sense, but uh, you know, sees the sense of what a PhD student brings to the problem, mm, mm. And, and if you can convince enough of them, that creates positions. I think that uh, that help, right? Uh, wonderful, wonderful. That's actually an important part. See, uh, this is a a crucial element where the career options have broadened, especially a person who has done PhD. Is expected to know how to think, uh, right? Exactly. That is uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. I'm not telling others don't know how to think. Correct. And uh, or taking a complex problem, breaking Correct. it down, and and paying attention over a particular period of time, which is relatively large, and uh, you know project level stuff. You know I mean, exactly what you said. <laughs> Take a complex problem, break, break it down, <laughs> collect the data, <laughs> yeah. keep thinking about it. Thinking, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because if you look at it, that is a training. Actually, which is necessary now, yeah. because the world is heading towards complex problems. Correct. You cannot take very short term, <laughs> you know, climate change for example. Yeah. This yeah. is one of the crucial. Uh, but, he, but he, I mean, even in a local sense, so like Chandni Chowk here has been having traffic problems. Yeah. You know, it's much more natural for me to imagine that if I take a smart PhD student and set them this problem, if, solve this, I think they'll do one. They will. They will like surely this. because see. Yeah. Th that is a crucial element. Sometimes people are now questioning, uh, and this is not only in India, why one should do a PhD. See, Correct. of course, Correct. if there are career options, other things, yeah. it's okay. But uh, there is actually an element of going deep into a problem. Yes. yes. It is not just for the sake of the fact that one does PhD for a period of five years. Correct. It's because Correct. you are not only looking what is going to happen in the right. in the future, but you are going to also study the history of the problem. Right. 
understand what are the possible solutions exactly you learn how to you know gather the right data, data. what data to gather yeah and questions yeah. are which are yeah, pertinent go deep to, that's no, the go, deep. go deep exactly deep the... so if you want to really do something deep you have to spend more time yeah. <laughs> in fact yeah. that gets lost in the in the conversation about a phd they correct, think okay correct. it's just a degree why do you have to exactly spend... they keep thinking of it i got a bsc i got an mc yeah. now i'll get a phd, a PhD. But it's really yeah. not yeah. that yeah. It's, it's a very professional Pro, yeah. it's a different thing. Dif- different different yeah. thing all, all together so this also brings us to now lighter moments of the <laughs> podcast <laughs> so first and foremost uh, i would be very keen on listening to you speaking in your mother tongue i know you also have given some very interesting talks uh, i should mention to our listeners that the sarab does a lot of outreach also in marathi uh, uh, yeah, because of, of course pune actually has superb uh, you know options, uh, to, options do to do yeah. that in fact that is you know I, it might sound a little boastful, but Pune is fantastic for outreach activities. That's true. Because there's so much of even the crowd is very interested. Yeah, exactly. The exactly. Yeah. The student community here is fabulous across the whole city, even yeah, yeah. across Maharashtra. I should yeah. mention. Uh, uh, no way to take away anything from other parts of India, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is a kind of uh, personal yeah. experience, and therefore I am just emphasizing. So, sort of, I request you to now kind of speak in your mother tongue. Tell us about your motivations, your research interest, etc. ठीक आहे मला वाटतं की पवनला सुद्धा थोडं थोडं मराठी कळत आणि हे मी नक्की म्हणेन की पवनला मराठी येतं का नाही तरी त्याच्याशी मराठी बोलणं हे खूप ऑकवर्ड आहे कारण माझ्या डोक्यात मी असं विचार करत राहतो की मी परत पटकन इंग्लिशमध्ये स्विच व्हावं ठीक आहे पण मराठीत सांगायचं तर ऍक्च्युली दोन हजार सतरा साली मला चान्स मिळाला होता की मी पार्टिकल फिजिक्स बद्दल मराठीत बोलू शकलो आपल्या विश्वाचे सर्वात छोटे तुकडे असा एक मी टॉक दिला होता गरवारे कॉलेजमध्ये आणि त्या टॉकला बहुतेक जी लोकं आली होती ती सगळे मोठी लोक होती म्हणजे स्टुडंट्स नव्हते ॲडल्ट होते आणि त्याला खूप मजा आली कारण का एखादा व्यक्ती जो वेगळं प्रोफेशन करत असतो एखादा वकील असो तो जेव्हा येऊन तुमच्या विषयाबद्दल प्रश्न विचारतो तुम्ही वेगळा विचार करता स्टुडंट्सचे नेहमी विचार असे असतात की बरं मग ह्याच्यात करिअर कसं करायचं किंवा हा फॅक्ट कसा असतो वगैरे ह्याच्या विरुद्ध जी मोठी लोक असतात ते तुम्हाला गंभीर प्रश्न विचारतात की ह्याच्याने माणसांना काय फायदा होईल आपल्या नॉलेजमध्ये कशी भर पडतीये आणि मग त्याच्यात खूप त्याच्यात खूप मजा आली होती खरं सांगायचं तर पुण्यात जितकं मराठी बोललं जातं तितकं मला नाही वाटत दुसरीकडे कुठे बोललं जातं आणि मी म्हणेन हे की मराठीचं माहेर घर आणि मग मला खूप लोक काय काय वाईट वाईट म्हणतील पण हे खरं आहे की इथं खूप सहजपणे तुम्ही मराठी पण बोलता खूप सहजपणे तुम्ही मराठीतून एखाद्या गंभीर विषयाची चर्चा कराल जी एरवी मी कधीच मराठीतनं करणार नाही म्हणजे जरी मी पॉलिटिक्स बद्दल बोललो तरी जी चर्चा होईल जे माझा पिअर ग्रुप आहे जे स्टुडंट्स जे विद्यार्थी आहेत बहुतेक वेळा ते हिंदी बोलणारे असतील किंवा दोघं बंगाली आहेत किंवा असे आहेत तर त्या मनाने पुण्यात पटकन असं होऊ शकतं की तुम्हाला असा एक ग्रुप मिळतो की जिथे पटकन गंभीर चर्चा होईल तर हे नक्की आहे की त्या त्या दृष्टीने हे मराठी बोलणं खूप सोपं जातं विविध वेगळे फायदे आहेत की मी आयसर पुण्याला आहे यातले बहुतेक आपले ॲडमिन स्टाफ जे असतात ते मराठी बोलतात त्याच्यामुळे त्यांच्याशी जर मराठीत बोललं तर त्यांनाही थोडस पटकन ऐकल्यासारखं वाटतं तर त्यांनाही असं वाटतं की ठीक आहे आपला माणूस दिसतोय सो हा फरक नक्की पडतो मला माहितीये पवन त्याच्या मुली मुलीमुळे किंवा प्रसाद स्व त्याच्या मुलीमुळे हे दोघंही पटकन मराठी शिकतायत कधी कधी मला ह्याचं वाईट वाटतं की माझ्या बरोबर इथं विविध प्रांतात वेगवेगळे कलिग्ज आहेत पण त्यांना मराठी यावं ह्याच्यासाठी मी काहीच करत नाही पण बघू मे बी ही पण एक चांगली आयडिया आहे की छोटी संभाषणं जर त्यांच्याशी मराठीत केलं तर त्यांचंही मराठी पटकन वाढेल कारण नाही आपल्या मुलींकडूनच मराठी शिकलं तर कितपत मराठी शिकतील माहीत नाही <laughs> yeah okay that's it oh wonderful wonderful sort of see that's the beauty beauty of the language you could see that uh, there is some different kind of connect yes right uh, that is uh, the reason why i request the guests to speak in their uh, mother tongue because that is something which is lacking in our system right Do see you... i mean so this is a bit controversial right but, but we've been we keep hearing these things nowadays that say that oh you should educate in mother tongue you will learn yeah, better yeah, and so yeah. on i don't necessarily buy into that philosophy because i think it comes from a place which is trying to enforce yes, something yes, yes. 
Yes. However, at the same time, in India, we always are naturally bi, tri, you know, quadrilingual. Exactly. I, I, in any conversation, you freely switch, switch between three between and four language. languages. We do this in the classroom, classroom also. Yes. I don't think we need it mandated Mandatory. that teach in, yeah. teach in mother tongue. And I think it really helps if you can do that connect. connect. It's quite interesting that and that connect happens even if I speak in Hindi, it's not my mother tongue. Exactly. But if I switch English Hindi, you know, people are happy, happy. and they feel comfortable responding that way. Absolutely. absolutely. This is the strength of our society. society you know, language absolutely. has never been a barrier. Lang language has never been a barrier. In fact, you know, it's always amazing that you could see that people, for example, Sunil Nair, our, our uh, colleague, he's actually a Malu by, uh, by, yeah. uh, by kind of uh, birth. His birth. But he speaks probably one of the best Marathi yeah. <laughs> among and, us because and, he was brought, and, I guess, and, brought up here. I was so surprised <laughs> to find out that he speaks like fluent Malayalam because I just assumed he grew up like me here and yeah. his Marathi is his mother tongue. Yes, yes, yes. It's quite fun because so so when I grew up in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, <laughs> a lot of my teachers were actually from Kerala, Kerala because yeah. you know Kerala immigrates large yeah, amounts yeah, of yeah. people there. But they would learn to speak Hindi, mm. and uh, so so you know I've heard the Hindi, you know how they speak it and whatnot. It's so rewarding, right? Like language it just melts away. At Absolutely. some point, you don't care, care what about language, what, just what, what language. they're saying. Yeah? What they're saying. You know, it's, it's all fake. The aura that we make <laughs> yeah. around you know, what language we speak. Yeah, it's absolutely right. Relevant. Absolutely. Yeah, as you mentioned very correctly, it's our strength. It's our we strength. We should build yeah. upon the fact that we are multilingual, and yeah. uh, that that really adds in a lot of things. And and that means that if we sacrifice purity of language, I think that's completely worth it. Worth it. it. Yeah. It, there's no sense in you know sticking to that. Is this pure Marathi or yes. is this pure English? Yes. It's language. It's meant to evolve. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. In fact. There is a quite a lot of research to back this up too. <laughs> For example, Stephen Pinker and yeah, uh, yeah. even Noam Chomsky and other people have thought about this. Yeah. My, my mom will point out uh, like these words in Marathi that are clear loan words from Arabic. Arabic is so, yes, kurchi, yes. Yeah, completely yeah, kursi. Yeah. Now clearly we are not speaking Prakrit anymore. Yeah, right? We are yeah. speaking language that has absorbed stuff. Absorbed. Yeah. And that's the language we speak today. You know, Very nice. English and Mandarin. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> exactly. we, we should keep doing this. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, Sarah. The final segment, which I would request you uh, to give us some recommendations about what you like uh, in form of books, art, uh, sports, or any 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 component. What you what motivates you? So, since we started this discussion yeah. from books, I, yeah. I think uh, I, I'd like to honestly recommend that people should read the uh, you know some some As Isaac Asimov. Yes, he's my favorite author. <laughs> For example, he does a lot of different things. There are hardcore science fiction. Hmm. Which is the foundation series. If you want to read anything, read that. But he also does this thing called the Black Widow series. Yeah, you, yeah, you know this, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's like four people who who come to dinner once a month together. Yes. And there's some small mystery that they solve at the table. Yes. Um, I I think I I would recommend that quite a bit. Um, I'm much more of a fiction person. I don't read mm. as much non-fiction. Um, occasionally a biography here mm, or there. Mm, mm. Um, but within the fiction world, most recently, uh, uh, Ashish, so Professor Ashish Arora, yes, uh, yes, 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 he mm -hmm. gave me this book called Dark Matter. Oh. Um, I forgot who the author is now, but it's been an incredible book that I've read after a very long, long time. time. Is it? You know, we we have of course we do scientific discussions of multiverse oh, oh. and uh, you know extra dimensions and 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 all of this, and so sometimes we get too focused on the science, science of it. part of it uh, we forget like how it would manifest mm. so in this dark matter book the guy builds up a machine or whatever mm. and and goes into these multi dimensions this idea has been around i don't yeah, know if yeah. you've seen the most recent spider man yeah. into the multiverse <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. it's an idea that's very yeah. common nowadays yeah, yeah. but it's a thrilling book mm. it's very real um i think for uh, for for scientists, especially a physicist, it's going to be very close to your heart because you'll connect to a connect lot of, to things, a lot of things. It's a scientist in the book, yeah. and um, you know they have regrets about say not not becoming the next big thing, but they they yeah. teach at a community college. Yeah. So there's a lot of even real yes, stuff yes, there. Okay. Nice, nice, um, oh, wonderful. And then sports. Um, it's nowadays quite fashionable to bash cricket, mm. um, but but I, but I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, like all Indians. I am an arm. I mean, not I am an armchair theorist <laughs> about it. Like you know, I'll have very strong opinions about who should be selected. <laughs> but I did play a bit. Um, yeah. I used to bowl off spin. Ah, nice, um, nice. I think uh, people should do something. You know, mm. it, it's uh, at our ages, especially, it becomes quite common to think that uh, you know you do sport just for the mere exercise yeah. of it. Like yeah. you know, it's good for your heart. It's good for this. 
but that's not true you know you go throw around a frisbee with a few friends there are lots of stuff that just melts away melts so away, so yes. you know yes. sport is a really powerful thing <laughs> absolutely and, uh, Absolutely. It should be it's part a, of your yeah. thing. It's, it's a part of... Uh, like getting up and moving. Right? moving. I mean, that's... Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. You you also have been actually an excellent artist. I should mention, you know, uh, Saurabh uh, sketches very well. That was also the lockdown. Yeah, yeah. So, I'll tell you this. For the longest time, I bought books about sketching. So, I, I have like three, four of these big, big books. Uh. I always kept thinking that I'll teach myself to, uh, uh. to, to sketch. Uh, so my my love of art comes from photography. Ah yes, um, yeah, that is another element I should emphasize. Yes, and, yes. and so even in photography, my my genre is portraits. Ah, mm. so then I kept thinking that if I want to sketch, I want to sketch people, ah, mm. and it turns out that's pretty hard. Yes, uh, if you make even minor mistakes, faces can look drastically, drastically different. Safe. And uh, I've been disappointed in the first few attempts where I I had tried to sketch Kajol, mm. and I showed it to at home to my <laughs> mom and. and She's like, yeah, it looks familiar, but I don't know who that is. <laughs> oh, I felt so disappointed <laughs> because it was so obviously casual for me. <laughs> but then, you know, uh, like with all things, lockdown gave me the opportunity to practice. practice. You practice, you get better. Yes. Um, and it's remarkable, you know, we've all heard this, like, you know, you have to play like, you know, 800 hours of guitar yeah, and then yeah, you get yeah. good and so on. This is true. It's quite surprising that in physics, we've internalized very easily. Yeah. Nobody expects a first year undergrad to be good. Yeah. You know that you need to do this over oh, like six, six years and yeah, then you'll get yeah. good. But we tend to forget these things when it comes to other things. Absolutely. We expect a bit quicker success. Absolutely. Um, I, I've started swimming again recently. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so there as well, it's the same thing. You have to remind yourself that go slow. Go it's slow. only been a month. Well, it's only been two months. Yeah, you know, yeah. You'll get better. Um, very true. Very true. Fabulous. Fabulous. So finally, uh, what are your kind of future directions uh, in terms of work, uh, including uh, research, outreach, which is already going great, but uh, what, what are the future prospects? So uh, I see broadly two two things that I'd like to pursue in sort of, you know, the next decade. So I've been at ISA for 10 years and in the next 10 years. In terms of research, um, I think at some point we as particle physicists need to really figure out something that is beyond mm. the standard model that is much more mm. concrete. Mm. I am going to be sinking a lot of efforts into what I was talking about earlier, the, the model independent stuff where you you expand what anomalies you are willing to look for. Mm. Like uh, I am going to do an, you know, an anti-literature survey in mm. the sense that go through literature to see what aspects are most popular and then in each of those cases try to do the exact, the exact opposite. opposite. Because uh, you know that's how good ideas are going mm. to be mm. and at some point it's no longer even a good idea. It's just you need to just look at mm. more places. More places. Mm. So even if it sounds like a terrible idea, unless you do it sometimes maybe we are not going to do this. You know, Nature is really good at fooling us. Feeling us yes, yes. So, so we, we need to make sure we can match it you know neuron for neuron. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then um, with these two other projects like the MSD which I did mm -hmm. really say that's about undergraduate teaching and, and, and I raised. Um, I find recently I've been much more engaged in the idea of improving education even a little bit in, in different places. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think we get caught up in the idea that you know here is a new technique and unless this is well refined and assessed and I know what impact it has, I'm not going to use implemented, it. Implemented, yeah. But given the size of India, you know, I've traveled to quite a few places mm, for this yeah, IRS thing. Yeah. Even small things make sea changes. See, yeah. You know, even if you spend one hour in a single classroom where you as a scientist tell students about mm, mm. the joy of, you know, mutual discovery, mm. uh, it, it, it's a huge, it's a multiplier effect. Perfect. That one hour for that student means a lot Not more than what you think. Exactly. You think, what am I achieving in an hour? Uh -huh. No, no, that student carries it for like two months two afterwards. Months, months. They try 10 things. It empowers them to go search for YouTube yeah, videos on something yeah, and yeah. understand what Walter Lewin is talking yeah. about. And I, I think I would want to do that a lot more and in a structured way that, you know, put out the right videos, you know, local language, uh, using local tools, using uh, local references. So, so that helps in the students connecting. I, I think I would like to pursue that oh, a bit wonderful. more. One inspiration for that is you. <laughs> uh, so the fact that you have so many of these podcasts out. <laughs> I'll tell you, it, it's it's easy sometimes to do a bit of outreach and then get a bit jaded, yeah, right? Yeah. You think that, okay, I don't know if it's really <laughs> working out or not. But to have this community, you know, a lot of people who have grand plans and who sort of sit down sit, and just execute easy, it, yes. it gives, uh, it support. You you feel that, yes, I can also do you this. Can, I can yeah, also do this. Absolutely. Um, wishing you all the best. 
wonderful thank actually you. Uh, to know uh, all these specific plans both from standard model viewpoint to the standard education yeah. <laughs> non standard <laughs> yeah. education viewpoint uh, so good. thanks a lot saurabh thank it's you. been thank an absolute one. pleasure uh, and uh, i'm i'm not surprised that we had this wonderful conversation i'm <laughs> i'm happy that by this chance we got two hours to talk, talk to each other exactly that, that's exactly. perfect and uh, i i am very thankful for you to spend this saturday <laughs> uh, morning with with me and uh, and also kind of you know giving your perspective of various different things so this is pratidhani where we try to humanize science with saurabh the way